Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Kartik, one of the co-founders of ETH Global, and I am super excited to welcome all of you to the Superflow Reactor Summit. So all of you are watching this on ETHglobal.tv, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, <clears throat> this is a platform we'll be using for all of today's summit, and this is the place where you can ask questions, say hi to everybody else watching, and also claim your POAPs. So everybody who's going to participate on the chat today will be receiving this amazing Superfluid Reactor Summit POAP. So I uh, can't wait to uh, meet all of you and uh, let's uh, let's get started. So today we have an amazing next few hours planned. We're going to be talking about the future of payments. We're going to start off with introducing the Superfluid Reactor, which I'm super excited for all of you to know about as well. Then we're going to have Tony come on and talk about how do we actually successfully manage subscriptions in Web3. Sunny will then be talking about how do we actually invest in more real-time payments and just make that way more seamless than it is currently. Then we'll have Herbal talk about salary-backed loans um, and how you can stream um, paychecks <laughs> and salaries. Uh, then we're going to have an amazing panel on just going through some really interesting ways to think about Web3 native business models. Uh, we'll have Christoph, Tarun, Julian, and Mike uh, as our panelists. And then Mia will be talking about the next kind of steps and evolution of the Superfluid protocol. And then we're going to close off with a way and a talk from Mike on just how do we think about the economy in Web3 that's a lot more connected to each other and just a lot more seamless. And we'll have another final panel on just on-chain payments and how we see that world uh, evolving with Luca, Mikhail, and Fran. And then finally, we'll have some closing remarks to wrap up the day. So super packed next few hours, and I can't wait to uh, get in right into it. So next up, I want to just, without further ado, bring on our very first speaker for the day, and that is Fran from Superfluid. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Fran to really tell all of you about the Superfluid Reactor. Welcome, Fred. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen and show a short presentation while I do this. So welcome, everyone, uh, to the Superfluid Reactor Summit. Uh, we're extremely excited to have uh, so many people joining in uh, to, to listen to this. We're very excited to be partnering with ETH Global for this. We're, we've got a very strong uh, relationship with ETH Global. We've sponsored a lot of their hackathons. And it's a great honor for us uh, to be able to have this platform to tell everyone a bit more about our ecosystem, our community, and uh, the future we see uh, enabled through our protocol. So first of all, let me just uh, do some sound check here. I hope by now most of you know about Superfluid, uh, but just very quickly, Superfluid is a DeFi um, protocol for digitally native programmable cash flows. We enable users to stream money on chain with no capital lockup and with full programmability. So effectively, Superfluid is a protocol. What this means is that it's a shared uh, means, a shared set of rules that govern the way information or value is transmitted. Right. So what we're doing is we're building the rails. We're building the rails to enable a new kind of finance that happens in real time because money streams happen every second. So everything needs to be kind of rebuilt to uh, use and to adapt to these uh, real time money streams. And the way we envision this is a completely free flowing economy, right? Where, where money can flow from application to application, from hand to hand in a peer to peer fashion on the blockchain with no friction. That's, that's what superfluid means. Superfluid means no friction. But obviously a protocol in itself is not that useful, right? It's just, again, a set of rules that govern the way information is transferred. What's really necessary and what we are really building for is for builders like you to enable you to come and build applications that leverage this cool technology that we've uh, invented, right? But that in itself is not useful. There's so many use cases that can be explored. There's so many different verticals. There's so many different uh, ways that streaming money can really change the way a lot of people experience uh, the transfer of value. And that's something we can't do alone. There's just no way we can explore all these different niches and uh, industries where money streaming could potentially have a big impact. And this is the reason why we're always trying to build for builders. We're always trying to invite more and more builders to come and explore the opportunities of the Superfluid Protocol. 
So far, we've sponsored over 20 hackathons. We've had over 400 projects built at hackathons. We've, uh, we're incubating a lot of uh, projects, although so far it's been mostly informal. We have a lot of integrations and there are a few projects that are already live and that you can go out and test right now that leverage the Superfluid protocol. But ultimately what we noticed is that a lot of products tried to build something at a hackathon, but it wasn't quite enough, right? A lot of people don't know how to go from a project built at a hackathon to a real life production application. That step is not that easy, but that step is what we did and it's what uh, we can help you do. Right, Superfluid was born at a hackathon, which means we know how to go from a hackathon project to a real life uh, working startup. So we asked our community, we said, you know, how can we help more of you, more applications uh, go from, you know, the prototype stage to the production stage? And obviously, a lot of the people who even replied to this question were people that we had helped, right? Because we helped a lot of people. You'll hear a bit more about this uh, from the next presenters, but we've helped people build on Superfluid and go and build startups from their ideas, but we never formalized that. And what, what the response was, was pretty clear. We need to create an accelerator. So what I'm announcing now is actually the Superfluid Reactor, which is an accelerator focused on your growth. We help startups that build on Superfluid by selecting the best ones, the best teams, the best founders, and the best ideas to come and join our community and start building with us. We follow you from fundraising, building the product, and launching the product, and securing those key partners that will get you started uh, as a rocket ship and not just as a hackathon project. And the best of all is that all of this is free. We don't charge neither in money nor in equity. So it's 100% free. And the applications, the projects, and the teams that we select will be able to go through all of this free of charge. And this is a very big difference compared to most accelerators out there who take a significant part of your equity. Now, if this is interesting to you, sign, uh, sign up here. So you can just go to reactor.superfluid.finance. You can find all the information. There's a sign up form and everything is there. But let me just tell you a bit more about the ways uh, that the Superfluid Reactor can help you get ready for production. And again, the Superfluid Reactor's objective is to get you to fundraise and to production. After that, it's up to you. So we're not gonna do the work for you, but we are gonna help you to get there. So the first thing is technical guidance. Now, as uh, Vincent says from our team, it's very easy to learn Solidity. It's very hard to master Solidity. Now, building an application for a hackathon is not the same as building an application for production, right? You can make something that works once, but working once and working a million times with no faults is completely different. And we can help you both architecting this, but also developing the right uh, practices in terms of testing, in terms of adversarial thinking that are really necessary when building in Web3. Now, unlike Web2, as you might know, Web3 contracts are generally immutable. There's a lot more that can go wrong and there's a lot less you can do about it. So it's very important that you know, the architecture of your app is correct. And if you're coming from Web2, there's a lot of new things that we can uh, help you quickly learn about. So again, building a prototype is not the same as building a production application. And that's where our guidance can really help you accelerate along that journey. Now, second, uh, second thing I'd mention is product refinement, right? If you look at uh, most uh, web-free products, they're not that great, but some of them are amazing. Now, how do they do that? They do that through uh, interviews. They do that by talking to their customers, by hearing their feedback, and by, by basically adopting that feedback quickly and adapting over time. So the way we can help here is obviously with general product management uh, practices, but also with introductions to who your actual users are. Right? Imagine you're building something in Web3, but your target user is not, some, is not really a category that you are that familiar with. Right? In that case, you can talk to us. We can introduce you to the people that you need to talk to to actually understand what that category's needs are. Right? And this is very important in the product discovery phase. On top of this, you can always book one-to-one -one time with our uh, product manager, Vijay, which means you, know, you can get his insight, get some of his expertise, and this is something that's always going to be available for uh, the Superfluid Reactor participants. Obviously, building a great product is very important, but you also need to get the voice out, right? You need people to know about it. And in this regard, marketing is the way to go. 
But marketing in Web3 is, again, extremely different to marketing in Web2, right? If you think of Web2, most startups spend almost all of their budgets on advertising, right? They'll give their money to Facebook, to Google, just to blast out advertisements, and that mostly works for them. In Web3, that doesn't work at all. If you spend money on uh, Twitter ads, nobody's going to read them. And in fact, that's generally bad practice, and people will actively ignore your product if you advertise. So how do you do it? How do you get out there? What you need to do is build a community. How do you build a community? Well, that's really hard, but we can help you, right? We've built a community at Superfluid. We have some people out there who are passionate about what we're building, and they are the best marketing tool that you can possibly have in Web3. Because in Web3, marketing is organic. And this is something we can talk more about, we can help you, and we can also introduce some of those early supporters that can really help you build an audience, which ultimately is what you need uh, when you're launching a product in Web3. On top of this, obviously building a great product is important, but you need to also get to market. You need to be able to get those first customers and perfect your product to the point where you meet product market fit. Now, how to do this? Uh, there's a lot of different ways, right? You can try and build in isolation and maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. But the approach that we generally suggest is to try and involve customers in your um, journey as soon as possible. And this is what we suggested to Tony from Diagonal. You're, you're going to hear a bit more uh, from Tony after, uh, after me. But what we did with them effectively guarantees that the day they launch, they launch with great launch partners, with a product that is specifically tailored to their needs, and uh, basically with the best possible partner uh, that they could launch with. So we're very excited to have helped them. And we're very excited uh, to hopefully in the future enable more people to launch uh, great products with immediate uh, go to market. Now, how do we achieve all of this? Well, most of this is not going to be us. It's going to be people we introduce. So introductions are by far the most important thing we can do for you. And this leverages over uh, five years of uh, industry connections that me and my co-founders and our team have created, right? We've been in the industry for a while. We know a lot of people, a lot of people know us and people respect us. So if we introduce you to someone, they're gonna listen, right? And they're gonna help you. And that's the single most important thing for product interviews, for marketing and community building. And of course, uh, for those key partnerships and those key launch partners that can help you go to market much quicker, right? So the people we can introduce are, you know, all sorts of different um, different uh, key people in the industry, and of course, the best investors. Ultimately, whatever you do in Web3 is going to take time, and time is money. You're going to need some sort of investment. This can come from the community, or it can come from venture capital investors or angel investors. We have a very broad uh, network of investors. We can introduce you to them. And most importantly, there's a lot of investors who are looking into our ecosystem. They're very excited to see the next application built on streaming money. And they're very keen to explore those applications very early stage. So this is the perfect pipeline for us to introduce you to them very early and get you uh, with the right resources to get to production much faster. So. Overall, uh, if this has uh, sounds like something that you would like, go to reactor.superfluid.finance and apply now. It's a very short uh, form that you need to fill in. We'll get back to you. And what you can expect is um, periodic check-ins, introductions, help throughout, uh, throughout the time that you spend with us, connections with other people in the Reactor project, which means you can you know, talk about your experiences and help each other. And of course, some exclusive perks for Superfluid Reactor participants. Now, what else uh, to expect from today? So we have uh, over three hours of content. So during this uh, Reactor Summit, we're you know, very pleased to invite a lot of people from our ecosystem. So you'll have people from Ricochet, Diagonal, Huma Finance, and these are all applications built on Superfluid. Uh, none of them went through the reactor because it's a new thing, but we did help them in different ways to get ready for production. And we're very excited to have them now come and share their experience, share their learnings with the rest of the community. After this, we'll have two panels. The first one is about uh, web free native business operations. And here you'll see some of our partners, Request Network, CoinShift, and Unlock Protocol, who are building um, basically products or protocols that help businesses operate on chain.
This is something we are very passionate about because at Superfluid, we enable uh, basically recurring payments, right? So these uh, applications are using us to provide real value to real uh, web-free businesses. And that's something we are very grateful that we can partner with them about. After this, we'll have another panel with people from MakerDAO and uh, USDC. So we'll be able to discuss uh, stable coins and on-chain payments. On-chain payments, in our opinion, are something that's very unexplored and needs to be explored more. So we're going to talk about that and we're lucky to have some, you know, very important experts. So thanks a lot for listening to my talk. I assure you it's going to be the most boring. So the rest are much more exciting, but all I can ask you now is if you don't follow us on super, follow us on Twitter, superfluid HQ, and maybe follow me as well. And now I'll give the stage back uh, to Kardec. Maybe there's uh, a few questions we can we can answer, and then we can move on to the next speaker. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> first of all, this is this is incredible, uh, and uh, thanks for kind of formalizing it. I know you've been uh, helping out a lot of uh, teams already. A lot of them we're going to see right now uh, come on uh, on stage and talk about what they've been doing. Um, I guess my, my broader question is um, overall kind of, if you can just give some insight into how do you think about managing this thing for the first kind of cohort here? Like, is there an expectation of how many teams you want to get into uh, the first round or um, essentially like, what are you looking for in terms of what stage they should be at? Like maybe we can start there. Yeah. And the well, one. we are hoping to get pro uh, projects basically straight out of the hackathon, right? Uh, as I said, Superfluid is born out of hackathon, you know, uh, Eve Global is kind of very embedded into our uh, history. And for us, uh, getting projects when they're still got that um, that excitement from the hackathon is the best time to really propel them. Um, at the moment, we don't have a clear number in mind, but there are definitely some projects that won't make the cut for the first uh, for the first cohort. But there's definitely a lot of room still. So if you're out there listening, one of the reasons we wanted to launch this during Hack Money is because Hack Money is the best DeFi uh, hackathon in the year, right? So we expect to uh, hopefully find some great projects here and bring them into the reactor and help them from here to go forward. So awesome. don't have exact numbers, but uh, it'll be a, I'm sure it'll be a good cohort because I've already seen some of the applications and they're pretty exciting. Uh, and then uh, uh, this... Uh just in, in the best interest of the teams that are going to be applying, uh, we often see a lot of people think that they're not good enough and they end up disqualifying themselves. So maybe if you can give any comments on like, what do you think is kind of considered a, a acceptable level of kind of progress so that they can convert their hackathon projects into something broader? Like, is there any advice you would give to like when they should think about their being ready? Of course. Um, it's really not so much about the product. It's a lot more about the team and the motivation. Right. The product obviously is important. Right. Uh, I think what a lot of people are going to see is now with the market shifting a bit, there's not as much money out there. So bad ideas are not going to have uh, as much funding as they could have had maybe six months ago. So really a good idea is important, but ideas can change over time. Right. What you build at the hackathon might not be the uh, idea that your startup builds uh, over the years but your team is not gonna change. Your founding team, your cohesion, your motivation, and your um, grit, right? Your, your um, basically determination to make it is the most important thing. So whatever, whatever you're building, when you apply, just make sure that that comes through, that we can tell that you are determined to uh, really make this happen, right? And then I'd say uh, you're good. Amazing, well, that's uh, excellent timeless advice. And uh, thank you for, uh kicking us off today. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, welcome our very first official talk, which is Tony from Diagonal. And Tony's going to be talking about how do we actually successfully manage subscriptions in Web3. So uh, Tony, please welcome. Uh, well, welcome yeah. on stage and I'll let you take it from here. Hey, Karthik, how are you doing today? I am doing great. All righty then, let me kick it off. Um, okay, share my screen. Please just confirm we're all live. Okay, uh, alrighty guys. So my name is Tony Rosler. I'm a co-founder of Diagonal Finance. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about web-free subscriptions. So the agenda of the talk today is threefold. First, we're gonna look at why on-chain subscriptions are a hard problem and why largely we haven't seen much in the space uh, kind of largely up until now. Secondly, we're gonna talk about the benefits of streaming subscriptions. And lastly, we will talk about why crypto native payment rails are important. All righty. 
So let's just kind of set the stage. So first, uh, we're all familiar with Web2 Payments and how subscriptions work with Web2 Payments. The way they work are essentially the bank pulls, let's say $10 a month out of your account once a month. Now this works okay because you trust the bank to pull money out of your account. And if the bank acts maliciously, then your account is FDIC insured and you can always claim the money back. Now, the issue is a little bit that if you try and move this model to blockchains, uh, you kind of run into some problems. So the first is there is no native way to pull tokens out of a user's accounts uh, simply on the execution layer uh, in blockchains. Now this is largely by, because by construction, blockchains are push-based payment systems where every change in state requires a transaction and every transaction requires an elliptical curve digital signature from the user's point of view. So what that means in a, in a very naive way, if a user wants to submit a $10 a month payment, they'll have to manually sign a transaction uh, and to kind of submit this payment. However, that's not really the full story because we can build a kind of certain approval-based applications on top of the execution layer. Uh, however, these payment systems have certain flaws. So all of these kind of pull-based payment systems largely boil down to this mechanism where a user will infinitely prove a contract and then a bot will on a kind of schedule, schedule transaction, execute transaction, pulling money out of the user's account and then paying the merchant at the end of the month. Now, the problems with these payment systems are firstly that they have trust assumptions. So when you are infinitely approving a smart contract, you are giving that smart contract the opportunity and the right to essentially empty your entire account for that token. Now, we have seen time and time again, the smart contracts uh, have these bugs when it comes to uh, kind of infinite approval, and there have been plenty of exploits around this area. And now the kind of important thing from a user's point of view is, my wallet is not FDIC insured. So if the smart contract or the bot executing a transaction acts maliciously, there's no way for me to get my funds back. Now this is a real problem. The second point is counterparty risk. So because payments are essentially enforced by external actors, I, the bot has to make a transaction once a month to execute that payment. If the bot fails to execute that transaction, you will not be paying the merchant and essentially the merchant will cancel your subscription and you will not have access to that service. Now, this is an issue because suppose the bot just disappears, then yeah, there's no way for you to essentially contact that bot or sue that bot because throughout in, in kind of Ethereum and smart contracts, agreements are enforced by code, not by courts. Lastly, an interesting point is kind of the lack of scalability. So having kind of these scheduled transactions requires N payments to make N transactions. So the question kind of becomes, so who first of all pays for the gas? And then what happens when the cost of execution of the transaction is greater than the fees earned from the bot for executing that transaction? So should the fees kind of, should the costs be pushed to the merchant side? As in kind of, it should be cut into their profit margin. Should the user pay the fees? So it becomes more expensive for them than it would otherwise. Or should the service provider, the, the payment provider pay the fees? Now, okay, this is kind of, there are many different ways you can go here, but if we perhaps look at some numbers, so this is some, this is based on analysis I did in last February, granted things may have changed, but I looked at USDC and kind of the average uh, on a 30 day kind of average, what was the average ERC20 transfer on the cost in terms of USD? And Arbitrum, we have roughly a dollar, same for Optimism and Mainnet was roughly 10. Now clearly, this is way more expensive than it would be in traditional fiat payment rails. So if we kind of summarize the problem with one thing, it's the beach problem. What would happen to your subscription if your payment provider went to the beach? Um, and essentially, your subscription would cancel. So this is not a decentralized payment provider, and this is not, um, I believe, kind of the ecosystem we want to be building. So all right then, so how does streaming solve this? So first of all, streaming has uh, zero trust assumptions. So the user pushes money continuously from their account to the merchant's account. There is, there are not, they are not approving anyone, money is pushed continuously. Secondly, there is zero counterparty risk because payments are settled continuously. So this is incredibly important for businesses where essentially they provide a service to the user throughout the month and then expect to be paid by end of the month. A good example of this is, let's say, an RPC provider, like Infura Alchemy, 
where you are allowed to make RPC calls. And at the end of the month, they send you a bill and they expect to charge for that bill. Now, these merchants have a massive problem, which is essentially that users can rack up huge bills that they are not able to pay for. And there's really no clean way to mitigate this because there's, you cannot settle continuously. You cannot settle every time you basically give value. So with streaming, you can do that, which is quite beautiful, where essentially every, every single second the payment is settled and money is leaving your account and entering your account. So this reduces the risk for the merchant dramatically. Lastly, scalability is incredibly important here. So you only have to uh, submit a single on-chain transaction to open a subscription and a single on-chain transaction to close a subscription. And lastly, something which is very cool is, uh, and also important is capital efficiency. So merchants are paid every second, which essentially means they can always put their money to work, always be earning yield, um, and just dramatically increases their capital efficiency. All right then. Well, let's also kind of think a little bit more broadly. So why is streaming not only better on those verticals we touch, but why is it largely better in general? So let's consider Netflix. So as we know, Netflix has been in the news a lot recently for essentially uh, they've been struggling in terms of their revenue and their business model. So if we look, and if we, and this is not all that surprising, really, if we look at Netflix's business model. So Netflix charges $10 a month. Now, this is a bad business model if we, because essentially you have a cohort of people who have a higher willingness to pay than $10 a month. And these people are getting a bargain where they are paying less than they're willing to pay. You also have a cohort of people who are not willing to pay $10 a month. They're willing to pay less than that, but they're being priced out of a Netflix subscription. So this means that Netflix is just capturing a very small area under the demand curve uh, and leaving a lot of money on the table. Now, if you introduce streaming, you, uh, something very, very interesting happens. So first of all, uh, if you just make Netflix a $10 subscription, a streaming subscription, you essentially now are creating an infinite number of price points below the demand curve. There is now a price point for a user who wants to subscribe for just one second a month. There is now a price point for a user who wants to subscribe for two seconds a month, or maybe you just watch 10 minutes of Netflix a month. And now the total revenue is just integral into this area. And as you can see, the total revenue captured by Netflix is much, much larger. Now that's just with one package. We can consider a multi-package setup where you have a team, family, whatever. And what you essentially see is that you can now capture all area under the demand curve. Okay, now another important thing is that uh, when we are dealing with streaming payments, we are dealing with on-chain verifiable payments, payments which are by construction crypto native. And this really allows us to reimagine and rethink uh, from first principles how we think about payments. So and if we look at the history of crypto and DeFi, one thing that you should always keep in mind is that you should maximize the composability at every vertical of the stack. So there's a reason Uniswap uh, tokens and V2 tokens, we are C20, V3 tokens are 721. Same similar with A tokens, the C tokens are all ERC20. So by moving state into a tokenized state, you become composable. And in the context of subscriptions, that can mean quite a lot, but we will discuss two things. The first is that subscriptions themselves can be composable. They can be represented in the form of NFTs. All right. So let's just imagine for a second, you owned an NFT saying you were the first subscriber to the Joe Rogan podcast. Now, clearly this NFT would have economic and social value in today's society. Um, however, sort of along the way, Joe Rogan would have experienced a lot of benefits as well. Because the moment you bought the NFT, you now acquired a real stake in his success. So the better Joe Rogan does, the better, like kind of the more valuable NFT and the better you do. Similarly, this provides Joe Rogan with organic distribution. Because essentially now Joe Rogan's um, subscribers are now his greatest brand ambassadors because incentives are aligned. And lastly, you, uh, this can be very interesting from Joe Rogan from a business point of view, because he can now essentially identify his subscribers, he can identify who was early, and he can reward them appropriately. He can assign them property rights, for example, early access to podcasting episodes, or special meet and greets at stand-up gigs. And he doesn't even have to provide all these services themselves. People can build services fun based fundamentally around these uh, kind of building blocks, um, because again, the subscription is fundamentally composable. Now, another vertical, which is very interesting to kind of investigate, is your service or your business itself being uh, on-chain composable. 
So what, what I'm kind of what you see on the screen here is something which is a little specific to superfluid and also what we're doing at diagonal, but nevertheless, I think it was interesting to share. So the way diagonal represents your business is that we represent your business as an NFT in the form of a, specifically it's an NFT and a super app. Now a super app is a smart contract where users stream money in to the smart contracts and the smart contract redirects that money automatically to the merchant and pays them every single second. So what you now have is you have a business which has predictable on-chain verifiable revenue, which means it can do things like take out under collateralized loans because now external actors can see this is a business, this business makes this amount of money every month, it's this reliable, and we can actually offer you a loan based on your, in, based on your risk profile, not the one of some risk agnostic pool. Okay. Another kind of interesting area about this is that you can also sell your business on exchanges like OpenSea, or even potentially fractionalize your business, creating kind of shareholders and community and distributing value to your community. Now, lastly, kind of we want to touch on why are crypto native payment rails important? So we'll perhaps only touch on two of these verticals, but let's start with DAOs. So as we know, there's a DAO, there's a kind of a B2B DAO service industry that's really booming at the moment and has been for a long time. And essentially, all of these services are SaaS services, which are providing services for DAOs in return for compensation. Now, the one thing DAOs will have in common is they want to settle in crypto on crypto native payment rails because interact with fiat is a massive headache. And more specifically, if they can pay in their own token, that is a huge benefit. So clearly in this scenario, having crypto native subscriptions and crypto native payment rails is very important. Secondly, you can think more in the future, perhaps uh, gaming. So if we consider a metaverse such as Decentraland where you can create your metaverse, do your own space. Uh, you can even, I remember reading Snoop Dogg was hosting concerts in Decentraland and the kind of economic activity which you can do in these metaverses is becoming increasingly sophisticated. And I really believe will kind of eventually will be just as sophisticated as the economies we see in the term, kind of the real world in today's society. Now, this means there will be service providers, and this means people will be demanding crypto native payment rails because they won't want to set, settle in token. Like, uh, I find it very hard to believe that one day, let's say, Decentraland or Sandbox will redirect you to a, a fiat gated checkout link where you have to put your credit card down and dox yourself to, let's say, buy an in game item. But okay, so that was kind of the talk. Uh, and again, yeah, I'm Tony, work at Diagonal Finance. If any of this sounded interesting to you and you think streaming subscriptions uh, are powerful, please uh, get in touch uh, either through kind of Twitter or you can even reach myself on Twitter or our website. And finally, we're hiring for several engineering roles. So yeah, have a great day, everyone. Tony, that was, uh, that was an awesome talk and a really great overview. I think, uh, I mean, I'm super excited and obviously good to see you in uh, on the other side after being, being a hacker too. Uh, my only kind of question is, um, you kind of talked about how all these things are working now and what you are able to do. Um, curious, like what you think is missing in this space and what would actually supercharge? Yeah, um, yeah, well, so what I think is missing is frankly a clean abstraction to in use this technology. So streaming payments is like what I think we will discuss for quite a while, is very cool. And this, this is very powerful. However, if you want to bring this piece of technology to the masses, to businesses, or even other protocols, every protocol is not going to write the solidity to integrate this themselves. They're not going to pay the money for the audits. They're not going to build off-chain monitoring infrastructure to make sense of the payments. They're not going to build the relevant dunning, dunning flows and the SDKs to integrate into their existing payment systems. So if you really want to bring this to the masses, you need a clear abstraction, which truly makes it just as simple as integrating streaming payments as it is to integrate Stripe or whatever it may be. There really shouldn't be a trade-off from a developer point of view. And I don't think there, there, there will be in the future. So this is why I really think is missing here um, and also largely what motivates us at Diagonal. I see, got it. So it, I got you. So it's not like we, we think we need a new op code or a new framework for everybody to generalize deployment. Yeah. Um, you manifest that. That, yeah, that's interesting. I don't necessarily think we do so. There, there have actually been people who've suggested opcodes in the future uh, previously, but this was uh, rejected uh, tremendously. And I think there's a nice blog post by Vitalik why 
something like an alarm opcode doesn't make sense, uh, specifically in doing asynchronous actions, uh, it becomes very complicated. Um, and yeah, it just this should you should, don't want to do this at, at, at the execution layer. This is a protocol layer problem. And then the question becomes: Do you want to have do you want to do stuff based on external actors and trust assumptions, or do you want to have on-chain verifiable value transfer? And I really think it's yeah, we think it's this one. I think uh, I don't think many people will disagree on you with this. <laughs> so, uh, well, that's awesome. Um, well, I am super excited to kind of see how Diagnum Finance uh, progresses and uh, yeah, just generally the fact that you can now use this thing to make a new way to think about under collateralized loans is uh, to me super exciting. So yeah. hopefully that becomes more and more common and uh, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, giving this amazing talk. Sure, no problem. Thank you very much. Amazing. All right, with that, we are ready for our next talk and that'll be Sunny from Ricochet Exchange talking about investing in real time. So. Uh, I got a preview of what he's going to talk about, but uh, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Sunny, and uh, I'll let you take it from here. Hi. Thanks, Kartik. Just going to pull up my screen real quick. Awesome. Everyone, I'm Sunny. Really excited to be talking to you guys about real-time investing today. It's a concept that I helped pioneer at Ricochet Exchange last year, and uh, today we're going to be basically defining what real-time investing is, go over why you want to invest in real time and the advantages of doing it. And then lastly, break down some projects that are currently in the ecosystem building on top of the concept of real time investing. So first, what is real time investing? Let's put, a let's put a definition to it. So I define real time investing as initiating a super fluid payment stream by the second on chain payment stream to a special super fluid enabled smart contract, which we call super apps, which will take the money that you've streamed into the smart contract, that being the super app, and periodically invest it into the target investment asset of your choice. So the only thing that you're really doing here to interact with this recurring automated investment process is simply starting a super fluid stream. There is no need to repetitively do deposits, or swaps. It's all abstracted into a single constant by the second super fluid stream. And so some examples of this would be, you know, streaming your money into a super app, which will accumulate Ethereum for you, streaming your money into a super app, which will invest into Bitcoin for you. You can even get more advanced, such as streaming your money into a super app that will invest it into yield bearing tokens or even staked sushi LP positions. So the possibilities of the real-time investing are limitless. And it's really kind of a really, it's really kind of a paradigm shift when it comes to uh, investing um, which we've traditionally experienced in kind of discrete um, swaps, transfers, and deposits. So let's talk about now why you want to invest in real time. What is let's let's point out the, the real advantages of real time investing. So the way we traditionally experience um, DeFi investments and those kinds of DeFi investment vehicles is through discrete transfers. And so with real time investing, you're taking away these kinds of discrete transfers and these you know, swaps and you're replacing them with continuous payment streams. When you think of investing or staking your money in Aave, you traditionally take X amount, you go to Aave and you deposit it. Um, or if you want to swap X amount from, from USDC into Ethereum, you go to SushiSwap, you go to an AMM and you make that happen with a single transaction, right? And if you want to, you know, invest recurring in a recurring basis, you'd have to basically go and you have to do these on your own, right? You'd have to go every so often, and make these swaps, make these deposits. And that's kind of cumbersome and it uh, requires transactional upkeep. Uh, with, with super fluid streams, we're able to, and the, co and the composable nature of them, you're able to essentially hook up these payment streams into these DeFi protocols and these DeFi investment vehicles um, through super apps. And you're able to basically abstract away those discrete transfers and deposits into continuous payment streams and basically make investment investing in these kinds of, um, opportunities, hands off and effortless. Uh, the second part here is the fact that real time investing is responsible. It's a responsible way to invest. Um, some of us are familiar with the concept of dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging is the idea of doing fixed investments on fixed intervals into an asset of your choice, right? So, an example here would be investing um, $5 into Bitcoin every single day. So, the power here is that you are investing in basically every single price instead of picking and choosing 
different prices and trying to time the markets. And so as a result, you're diversifying away price risk, which is very powerful, um, especially in the kinds of markets that we're seeing today. You may invest, you may believe heavily in the in Ethereum and the future price appreciation of it. But if you had bought in a lump earlier this year, you would be like well in the red. And so with real-time investing, you're able to linearly accumulate these kinds of investment assets and basically remove price exposure um, as a one-time lump thing and make it kind of a gradual linear exposure, which is a more sensible and responsible way to invest. The third aspect here is the networking of cash flows. So the idea here is that if we have an ecosystem of money moving in real time, um, you can network cash flows from inbound streams into investment streams. And so this is so critical to the superfluid ecosystem um, that I've basically dedicated a slide to it. So the quote here is, if money can move in real time, then it should be able to be put to work in real time. And so the idea here is if we're having an economy where we're constantly paying for things in streams and we're receiving our income in streams and we're having this money move around by the second, we have to wait for that money to accumulate and then kind of do our swaps and investments and these kind of discrete, discrete one-off transfers the user experience hasn't been improved that, that much. And so the idea here is to basically connect these kinds of real-time cash flows that are moving around in, our, in this digital economy to investment cash flows such that the, the second that this money hits our wallet, we can put it to work with these investment cash flows. So um, by, creating a, by creating an ecosystem of real-time investing apps and giving people the opportunities to invest in these traditional DeFi vehicles with, um, with real-time cash flows, you're able to basically you know, provide more utility for these people that are having you know, real-time finance. And you're also able to um, reduce the kind of transactional upkeep that these people would traditionally experience without these real-time investing applications. So overall, um, it's a really kind of, it really adds more utility to people using streams. It gives you another reason to transact in streams and kind of is an incentive to enter the real-time finance economy. And uh, yeah, as, as, the, as the ecosystem grows, I'm sure that the use of these real-time investing apps will grow as well. So that's the idea here, kind of like, you know, if you're receiving say the thousand, 10,000 USDC per month in a, in a salary stream, like by the second super fluid salary stream, um, an example of using network cash flow will be carving off you know, uh, a stream of like 3,000 USDC per month into a, a real-time investing app, which will convert it into Ethereum or something for you. Um, basically kind of cash flow in investment stream out uh, in like an, in, an, in, an, in an adjacent stream. So that's, a, that's the idea of network cash flows. All right, so I wanna talk about two basic entities that could use real-time investing, kind of dumbed it down into individuals and DAOs or organizations. So when we think about individuals and um, their use of real-time investing, well, traditionally when we invest, we think about that in a monthly amount, right? We say, okay, I'm gonna invest $500 into my Roth IRA each month. I'm going to invest $200 into Ethereum. And this usually requires us to make those manual deposits on our own. We have to go into our accounts, we have to do those transfers and we have to you know, make that in a manual fashion. And so with real-time investing, you can automate that. You can basically create a customized automated investment plan by choosing the different real-time finance, real-time investing apps and which kinds of investments you want to invest into and customize which rates you want, the rate at which you want to purchase these assets and essentially create like a stream portfolio. You can basically say, okay, I want 100, uh, 100 UCC of ETH each month. I want 100 UCC of, of the DeFi Pulse Index index each month. These kinds of different assets you can basically customize them into a real-time streaming portfolio and make that process very easy and hands-off. Um, and basically initiate it with single, you know, start stream transactions. So it's it's very simple. And so um, it's really awesome the way that we're able to abstract this away into a single start stream. It's an amazing user experience. And traditionally accomplishing this is very kind of uh, difficult and technical. Some people, they make these kind of investment scripts that, do, that connect their wallet and kind of do it in that kind of, fashion. Um, some people, they try to go through centralized exchanges and face some, and, and facing like very heavy um, exchange fees. This is a very kind of nice, lightweight, um, simple way to accomplish it through Superfluid um, with real-time investing. Um, the, other, the other entity here are DAOs or organizations or businesses. 
a lot of these DAOs, they sit on a lot of idle capital on chain and they have a low risk tolerance in putting that capital to work. And so a lot of the conversation around putting it to work um, usually comes down to the strategy of dollar cost averaging, like I spoke on. And it's usually like the, the primary way that these DAOs put their capital to work in that kind of responsible fashion. These DAOs, they, these DAOs, they don't want to be in the business of, you know, having active trading groups and things like that. Um, they simply want to find the most simple way to gain exposure to the assets that they trust in. And real-time investing is the best way to do that. You simply start a stream and there's no need for that kind of transactional upkeep, which can be difficult with DAOs because, you know, you have these multi-sigs, you have levels of permission with these treasuries and having to work with that, those kinds of recurring investments can become difficult when you can turn it into single streams and super fluid, you know, automation, um, it becomes a lot easier for, for these DAOs and um, reduces that kind of red tape. Another kind of red tape that real-time investing reduces for DAOs is decision-making. So with, um, with real-time investing DAOs, an example here would be like a DAO, they can trigger an on-chain start stream transaction that will invest say 10% worth of its treasury into an asset over the course of the year with a single vote. So that really kind of paints a picture of how, you know, these DAOs, they can basically turn the their investment strategies into um, very kind of simple decisions because it's all kind of coming down. It's kind of all abstracted into um, an easy start stream transaction. So um, it does help DAOs in, those kinds of, in, that, in that kind of sense as well. So that's the idea on who um, needs real-time investing, kind of painting, painting the picture there. Uh, let's let's kind of flip the page and talk about the kinds of products projects that are in the ecosystem building these kinds of real-time investment solutions so the first i want to talk about is butter butter was a hackathon project from i believe eth amsterdam they help DAOs essentially diversify away from their governance tokens over time using superfluid streams by streaming those governance tokens into balancer v2 pools and so the reason this is powerful is because DAOs, oftentimes, they have a lot of financial exposure to their own governance token, right? I believe the Masari report reported that most DAOs have like over 90% of their value locked, 90% of their treasury value locked within these governance tokens. And so Butter allows these DAOs to gradually over time reduce their exposure to these governance tokens into more solid assets such as stable coins or you know, blue chip tokens such as Ethereum or, or wrapped Bitcoin. And so that's what Butter's accomplishing. Um, hope to see that product, project uh, take flight soon. Uh, another project we have in the ecosystem is the DAM protocol. Um, stands for Decentralized Asset Management Protocol. Uh, we, we refer to them as DAM. They are working on a project called DSIP, which essentially allows you to dollar cost average into managed portfolio positions on DHedge using superfluid streams. And so essentially you're automating these streams, which will stream money into these different portfolio managers on DHedge that run these kinds of different investment portfolios um, based on their own kind of strategies. And so it's, um, and so it's quite advantageous for, for investors that are looking for this kind of magic, magic exposure in a responsible fashion. And last but not least, we have Ricochet Exchange. Ricochet Exchange is the real-time investing OG um, I helped co-found it last year. Ricochet Exchange allows you to basically dollar cost average into investment assets, into various tokens of your choice. Um, Ricochet Exchange was the very first community deployment of a super app on Polygon. So they're kind of the, 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 the real OGs um, when it comes to not just real-time investing, but also uh, development on Superfluid in general. And so they're so, uh, they're so important that I dedicated a slide to their flagship product. Uh, the Rex market. The Rex market lets you essentially dollar cost average with superfluid streams. I want to kind of break down the, the kind of uh, architecture of their of the the Rex market super app. So the Rex market super app here is represented by the Ricochet logo um, in that black box there. Essentially, what we have here are users, investors. They stream in their DIX into the Ricochet super app. The Ricochet super app every thirty minutes has a trigger. As a keeper trigger the distribute function, the distribute function takes the DIX that is accumulated in that Rex market super app, turns around to Sushi Swap or an AMM, swaps it to the target asset, that in this case being Ethereum, um, and then distributes that Ethereum back to investors all in one shot um, using Superfluid's instant distribution agreement. And so 
this um, this is an amazing user experience. They're just streaming in money and they're dollar cost averaging. And uh, it's also very scalable because um, believe it or not, this Rex market can have like a million different users and it will still have the same fixed gas cost when it comes to distributing that target asset Ethereum back to the investors um, because it uses something called the instant distribution agreement by Superfluid, which basically assigns distribution shares um, to the different streamers based on the size of their streams. And so there's no need to do kind of individual transfers up and down the list of people who are investing through the Rex market. So it's a very kind of interesting um, scalable structure to do this kind of real-time investing. And um, it's a uh, super powerful and it's honestly the very best way to do on-chain DCA. I've done my homework, I've looked at all the models and this is the most scalable framework to make it happen. Um, so it's a great app that's made possible by Superfluid. Um, I also want to touch on the fact that using the Rex market is non-custodial. So when you um, when you invest, right, it's like when these people are streaming their money into the Rex market contract, at any one time, the Rex market contract only holds 30 minutes worth of the total value streaming into it. And so as a result, there's very little TBL in these Rex market contracts. And so there's little smart contract risk and also that Ethereum is distributed straight back to investors. So these investors, they don't have to go to the Rex market contract and claim the money on their own. Um, it just shows up straight into the wallet and so they can start you know, using it in their in their day-to-day -day, um, and, and take action with it and take advantage of other DeFi opportunities as they see fit as the money is you know, straight in their wallet. So uh, yeah, that's the deal here um, with Rex markets, the best model for on-chain dollar cost averaging. So yeah, I wanna end the presentation with a call to action. Real-time investing is growing. It's gonna grow with the Superfluid ecosystem. And so I highly recommend that you join the community, join the real-time finance and real-time investing conversation by hopping in the Superfluid Discord, up in the Ricochet Discord. You'll find the links there at ricochet.exchange. Um, go build something. There are so many things that have not been built yet with, with real-time investing. We still need an app that lets you stream your money into, into stake Aave, um, A tokens. Uh, there's just so many different ideas out, out there and our DevX team is ready to help you um, get off the ground with them if you if you want to kind of take them up. And uh, we'd love to help and, and basically help and developers bring these kinds of real-time investing apps to production. And then lastly, use Ricochet Exchange. Try, try out their app. It's live at app.ricochet.exchange. Um, you can try it today and um, it'll really give you a taste for what's possible with real-time investing. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys embark on that real-time investment adventure. That is my talk. I want to thank you all for your, for your time and attention. Um, go follow me at Sunny Jacer on, on Twitter. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the Superfluid Reactor Summit. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that, Sonny. Um, it's been an amazing presentation. Um, we're getting in a couple of questions uh, from the audience. So I'll start asking them. And uh, in the meantime, if you, uh, anybody on the audience have more questions, just type them up in the chat and we'll relay them here. So uh, kind of the first question is, um, I, I think there's, a, we'd love to get a bit more um, understanding of how are people able to get the ETHX token from providing DAI? So I guess what's happening behind the scenes and if you can sort of uh, cover that uh, flow. I'll start with that. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. So essentially what's happening is the ETHX is being streamed to the, into the Rex market contract. It's accumulating there. The distribute takes all this. It basically sweeps all the DIX that's landed in the contract. It takes it to an AMM, converts it into ETHX. So basically like basically um, regular Ethereum that wraps it into ETHX, that being the, the super token version of Ethereum that's able to be distributed with the instant distribution agreement. Um, then it is sent out to investors all at once using the instant distribution agreement. And the reason that's possible accounting wise is because the, the super the, the, the Rex market super app, it assigns distri distribution agreements, sorry, distribution units to investors proportional to the size of their stream, right? So if you're streaming in 200, you die and I'm streaming in 100 die per month, you're going to receive twice as much of the Ethereum as I do. And so based on that accounting, the Rex market super app is able to distribute out the ETHX in the commensurate amounts based on this kind of proportion um, accounted for in the instant distribution agreement. Um, so really cool stuff there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, hopefully uh, 
that also makes sense to so the person who asked the question. <laughs> and uh, there's another question that came in, but uh, I think it's more directed towards Superflow at the protocol. So I'll still ask it to you because I think you can still answer it. But uh, if we need more clarification, we'll have uh, somebody from the Superflow team uh, directly answer on the chat. So the question is um, just overall, I guess, how dynamic, uh, actually, let me say that directly. Can we control the stream using the an external dynamic value in terms of uh, what the amount is that gets distributed? I uh, control the stream based on the what dynamic value? Just any externally defined dynamic value. Yeah. Um, so Superfluid now has a thing called ACL. So this is called access control list. And so um, it basically with this kind of function, with this kind of functionality, you're able to give a super app the ability to control your stream and change different change the stream rate on your behalf. And so you could have a keeper or or a, or an oracle or something connect to that to that super app and then the super app could respond to the changes in the Oracle um, based on what, whatever kind of in, indicator or KPI it is, and then adjust your, your stream rate accordingly. And so using that, you can accomplish something like a, like a stream investing tool that will only invest between a price range or something like that. So definitely possible. Awesome. Well, that's a, that's a lot more uh, kind of power on the, the programmability of this stream payment. So uh, hopefully Philippe, that answered your question. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for taking the time today and, uh, Really appreciate this. Awesome. All right. With that, we are ready for our next talk. So next, I want to invite our bull from Huma Finance to talk about how do we actually stream salaries, um, salary back loans. Um, and uh, I think this also is a really nice segue for what we just answered. So uh, this kind of enables a lot more new creative ways to uh, talk about this. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Kartik. Um, hello, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen quickly. Um, I changed the topic slightly to streaming income back loans because uh, I think salary um, is a is a component of that. And um, instead of talking about you know human finance and um, you know how the product works and everything, um, I'll kind of like talk more about why this is important and why um, right now is the right time and how Superfluid actually enables um, this experience to be so much greater um, uh, than uh, what could it be. Uh, so again, Ergil from Hima Finance, I'm one of the co-founders um, and uh, glad to be here. The, the first thing to, to understand is basically where things start and where they are going um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, it, you, know, you all know it started with you know, this white paper by Satoshi. Uh, they defined Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? Uh, you know, as many people call it, it's kind of like a digital gold. It's a digital asset, and it has a blockchain system behind, which is a distributed ledger that keeps track of who owns what. Correct. Um, and that, you know, obviously, you know, excited a lot of people, including many people in this room today. Um, but that was very limited because it only defined a single type of asset and only basically who you know um, owns what. And the biggest innovation after that was actually Ethereum. Uh, because Ethereum enabled uh, this new concept called asset portfolios, right? Because of the ERC20 standard, NFT standards, you have all these different standards that can actually liberate um, people who are creators to create this kind of assets. Um, and we started building asset portfolios. People started to talk about these asset portfolios, their asset portfolios, their token portfolios, NFT portfolios. And naturally, DeFi, as we call it, the centralized finance, um, start basically thinking about, okay, how do I tie these things together? Right, these assets together to create protocols that kind of like uh, does some kind of a financial engineering, maybe you know, introduces some kind of inflationary token, some reward mechanism, so people can utilize asset portfolios. So for a long time, um, if you look at the DeFi protocols, they only understood assets, they only leveraged assets, and they only created these kind of pairing structures or bonding structures between assets uh, to do finance, financial engineering. Um, and we got to a point where majority of the you know DeFi protocols were over collateralized protocols where you have to have you know a lot of assets that you need to collateralize to be able to benefit from these protocols, and that created uh, not only a small market for a small number of whales and speculators because there's not much use for over collateralizing all these assets, it also created a you know highly capital efficient market. Um, and it also created a highly dependent market where every single token is tied to each other, right? You had all these engineered payers and um, things that tied to each other, where anytime, you know, something bad happens to one of them, uh, we had this cascading effects across the ecosystem. Um, and we are in one of those probably downturns right now, unfortunately. 
Um, and, and that's also probably one of the reasons why, you know, DeFi as a kind of whole hasn't really grown um, as much. Um, but innovations are, you know, um, right, right in front of us. And one of those um, changes happening in the whole ecosystem outside of DeFi is basically this transition from asset portfolios to income portfolios. If you think about the next billion people, right, coming into this ecosystem, they're not bringing in millions of dollars in assets. Right. They have not much utilization for all these overclockedized protocols and they're not necessarily interested in speculation. They are coming into this ecosystem because of the income opportunities, right? Income opportunities that are, you know, eminent in the NFT marketplaces as creators, income opportunities in DAO marketplaces, income opportunities as Web3, you know, builders and developers uh, like ours, um, but also, you know, income opportunities in these new play to earn external ecosystems. Um, and people are being attracted to this and the next billion people are coming in because of income opportunities and they're starting to build income portfolios, right? Instead of the kind of real world scenario where you have maybe one job and one salary, um, now you have actually all these different ecosystems and communities you're a part of and you're building these income portfolios. And this is going to be the new type of passion gig economy, um, uh, you know, uh, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So, you know, that's why I call it bye-bye hodlers and welcome builders uh, because that's kind of like where, where we're going and the next billion is, I'm interested in. And this this actually gives us a pause because um, if you think about, you know, the next building coming um, for this income opportunity and building income portfolios, there is no DeFi protocol today that can actually leverage that, that can actually understand your income portfolio and can lend you against that. Um, however, uh, when you got stuck in assets, again, we talked about this capital inefficiency problem, uh, the income uh, underwriting, income is underwriting can also solve this capital inefficiency problem. If you, ex you know, actually look at um, how uh, traditional finance does lending today income is the most critical input in lending right so if you want to get a mortgage if you want to get a car loan if you want to get a personal loan credit you know card um, business loan doesn't matter what you want to get if you go to a lender doesn't matter also you know what your credit score is uh, the first and foremost thing they want to know is what is your income right you need to provide this you know payroll statements or cash flow statements if you're you know business getting a loan and then they actually put that in as the most important input into calculating, you know, what kind of a loan they're going to provide you. And there's this term called, you know, debt to income ratio, um, and, and that's kind of like the critical critical input they use from the income. Again, yet there is no use for income today uh, in any of the DeFi protocols. And that's, that's kind of like why uh, we believe it is, you know, both the time, but also uh, it, is, it is our, you know, opportunity and responsibility to provide this kind of financial opportunities Otherwise, you know, if you're like me, if you spend, you know, most of your time in this, this world and actually, you know, majority of income comes from this ecosystem, uh, if you want to get a mortgage and go to a traditional uh, bank today, they will laugh at you. Um, they will not give you anything. If you want to get a car loan, they'll not give you anything. Uh, again, doesn't matter what your credit score is because, you know, your income doesn't necessarily count uh, in that world. So that's, that's, that's where um, we believe um, this critical input needs to have its own primitive and needs to is actually um, uh, become a, a significant part of, you know, the lending protocols. And um, Superfluid here uh, provide a very interesting opportunity uh, when we went to Ethereum Denver a few months ago and start thinking about, okay, like how do we really, you know, leverage this and build this? And, and one of the first things we realized is first and foremost, you know, when you again go to a traditional financer and want to get, uh, uh, you know, a, a term, a type of loan, they ask you for this, you know, um, copy or photo, photo of your, income um, uh, uh, statement, it's like, you know, payslip or, you know, whatever you might have. Um, but it is much more uh, useful for DeFi protocol for this incomes to be actually, you know, in a contract. And streaming is one of the actually best ways uh, to um, look at and understand income uh, on chain because streaming um, signals a couple of different things, right? Streaming means that the, the payer who's paying this income actually has very high trust in this payee uh, because they're, you know, creating this very continuous uh, form of payment, which is streaming. It's also something where you can understand in real time if there is actually, uh, you know, a, a breach of contract or if some, some kind of a divorce between the uh, payer and payee because the stream is going to be cut um, at that point. So you have full understanding of, you know, the uh, different events that might impact this kind of underwriting. Uh, so uh, when you start, you know, looking into Superfluid, obviously, you know, like many of you, you're very impressed with uh, what they have built. And it gave us a very easy SDK to utilize to understand all these different streaming, you know, incomes uh, that are happening, and we're able to, you know, build a, a simple prototype that leveraged that. Um, and not only that, it actually helps us in another way, which is 
Uh, one of the most important things in automated lending uh, is to be able to collect also the, the money you landed automatically. Uh, again, this doesn't necessarily happen in traditional finance. You have to remember you know, to pay the lender back. But uh, if you're actually getting paid um, in, in a stream, uh, the moment actually the user borrows money against their stream, they can also open a payback stream as well and start paying back every single second, right? So this was not necessarily, again, possible in the real world in traditional finance scenario, but it's possible in a streaming scenario because both you can have a very strong understanding of the income because you have this in your stream going on and it's in a smart contract and you have the events emitted, but also you can open a payback stream and the people can actually start paying back in a second um, the moment they you know, borrow the money from the protocol. So it's also uh, very convenient uh, from that perspective and creates a large amount of trust within the protocol itself. Um, the other thing, actually, when you look at you know what's going on with the large ecosystem, uh, is this you know uh, new uh, paper published by uh, Vitalik uh, Pujai and Glenn, uh, I guess about you know uh, ten days ago or so, and you have to read this if you haven't you know read this yet. It's called you know, the Central Society uh, Funding Web Three Soul, um, and it's talk about you know the soul bound tokens. Um, one of the uh, challenges in uh, undercapitalized lending of any kind, uh, especially uncapitalized lending uh, that's income backed, is a uh, mechanism that understands you know, who is behind this, who is on the other side of uh, this, this borrowing. And in our current form of our kind of like V1 design, uh, we don't have a great mechanism to actually uh, understand who is behind this. That's why you know we have to design a protocol that understands the wallet and talks about you know the wallet and uh, looks at the income potential of the wallet. However, um, going forward, uh, there's a you know a, a huge enablement that comes with the soul bank tokens because soul bank tokens can uh, make sure that certain things are not necessarily transferable uh, between different wallets and they are kind of like soul bound to the. Uh, person that's behind that wallet. Uh, in in the wallet, uh, in the paper itself, it talks about basically one of the biggest enabler, uh, enablers for for this technology is basically the issuance of um, uncontrolled and uncontrolled lending. Um, another actually interesting utilization of this technology is creating a debt statement that actually stays in wallet. Right. So if actually someone takes a debt um, position against their uh, streamed income, you can actually create a token that defines their debt statement. Uh, that is soul bound uh, for that vault as well. So there's kind of like a lot of interesting ways you can create this more contract, you know, uh, like um, environments and uh, uh, use cases uh, on chain. Um, and again, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, uh, the evolution of FEMA finance and why we started, you know, in Denver, uh, especially with uh, Superfluid, um, one reason was the utilization of the superfluid uh, streams in terms of like the understanding and the signal of the income. But the other aspect of it was basically the, the awesomeness of the superfluid term, because uh, when we started digging into, you know, how to utilize this um, uh, SDK they built and the ecosystem they built, uh, we quickly found a you know, group of people who are very passionate to, you know, sit down with us and dig in with us um, into uh, how we can build things um, both within superfluid ecosystem and also outside of the ecosystem. Uh, so we found great partners um, and we start building, you know, our, um, our prototype at Ethereum Denver two months ago, uh, utilizing uh, their, their technology. And we were the DeFi track winner at Ethereum Denver. Uh, and also uh, we were picked as the best overall project built on Superfluid. Uh, and that really gave, gave us the kind of um, courage to actually all go full time and do this um, uh, as a real um, uh, uh, startup, and we just raised eight million dollars also in seed funding from some of the best um, investors. Again, uh, you know, uh, uh, thanks to Fran and the Superfluid team, and and they're they're a lot of confidence in us and some of our other partners. And uh, where we're going next is uh, providing a credit line for every wallet out there, uh, because we strongly believe income deserves credit, ready to use anytime. And it's also important to denote that uh, we should never think about income only as uh, a streaming salary, uh, because uh, the, the overall growth of the ecosystem is showing us that income can come in any form. So one of my co-founders, Richard, uh, he's a big, uh, you know, uh, participant in the Plato ecosystems. He's actually earning, you know, probably upwards of thousand dollars every month uh, by just, you know, playing uh, Web3 games. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, uh, millions of people coming to the ecosystems and earnings, you know, total of billions of dollars uh, from this ecosystem. Same thing with creator ecosystem, same thing with metaverse, the same thing with 
some other uh, mechanisms where artists actually can start earning, you know, in this ecosystem uh, through royalties and and rents um, of uh, different types of tokens. So uh, there's just this, you know, growing ecosystem of um, income portfolios as we see. And that's why we're so excited to um, be here today, uh, talk about uh, what we started building. Uh, we don't have a website uh, that has an application just yet. Uh, we will um, um, have something in the coming weeks uh, and we will be in production um, uh, in Q3 uh, this year. But um, in the meantime, I'm more than happy to take your questions and talk more about income backed, um, uh, streaming income backed loans and um, anything along those lines. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, that was super awesome. And I'm uh, super excited to hear that all this has happened in the last uh, three months. <laughs> uh, that must have been a, a crazy uh, journey already. Indeed, indeed. So uh, maybe one kind of obvious question would be just how do you uh, can expect people to uh, to use this? And like, what would you have some ideas for uh, like how this could be a better integration? What would you like to see uh, from the end users? And like, what can we do beyond just the basics of, of streaming this? Perfect question. So the way we kind of um, going about integrating this into different ecosystems is we're looking at special two ecosystems. One is the on-chain payments ecosystems, right? So Superfluid obviously is a key participant in this ecosystem. But if you look at what Superfluid is also integrating with, you know, you see things like Request Network, for example, where Request Network is an invoicing, you know, um, system where you know hundreds of millions of dollars every year is running through the, the invoicing system. Uh, you see, you know, uh, payment companies like PayMagic, Utopia Labs, where uh, these are the tools utilized by DAOs and their treasuries to pay people. Uh, so we're looking into direct integrations with those tools because we heard uh, from many of these uh, players and, and partners that people who are actually getting paid um, are in need of simple financing, right? So they cannot go to their own bank. They cannot necessarily go and, you know, uh, double down on the credit cards uh, because their income that they need to, you know, utilize to borrow against is, is on chain. And uh, we will be integrating deeply uh, with these uh, uh, ecosystems and, and, and partners uh, to basically provide us as a native capability in those uh, applications. Another uh, uh, partner uh, uh, ecosystem we'll, we're talking to right now is this again, you know, play to earn ecosystems and external ecosystems. Uh, so if you think about the biggest barrier uh, for uh, you know different type of gamers to join those ecosystems, is the barrier to acquire assets required to play the game. So for example, if you want to you know play um, certain play to earn games, you might need to you know put up to thousand dollars, maybe sometimes more. Uh, to acquire first assets and then um, play the game and yes there are you know maybe guilds that you know will lend you some of these assets and then they take away 80 percent of your income uh, but you know you never have the assets yourself you never liberate as a you know, player and the you know more you play the guilds you know have more income not you uh, so you know we're looking at basically partnering with some of these large ecosystems right now so that you know when uh, they want to onboard new gamers uh, actually you know we're able to look at their future income opportunity and lend against that so there is more of a liberation from the you know players perspective to participate in more of these ecosystems uh, so those are two big you know um, ecosystems we're looking at and we're excited about the growth of those um, um, overall uh, we have some other um, you know ideas in mind that we haven't prioritized yet you know one of them is uh, we're talking to some you know wallet uh, partners where Again, we envision eventually a credit line for every wallet. So let's say you go to MetaMask, you go to you know, Rainbow Wallet, whatever is your favorite wallet, and you say, check my credit line powered by Huma. Boom, you have a credit line that might be originated by some of our liquidity partners. So it's kind of like the um, different use cases and scenarios we're thinking through and building for. Well, that's a <clears throat> that's a really good, uh, no, yeah, especially if it's available as like a line of credit on a, on a wallet that just gets to a closer normal banking experience that- uh, Exactly. Uh, uh, as a question from the audience, from from Rachel, um, uh, the question is gonna from could, could this also be used for for business income as well? Because you kind of talked about personal loans, but is there any totally. logistical difference there? Totally, there there is no difference from a protocol's perspective. The protocol understands income right on a world perspective from a world perspective. Um, if anything, actually, business income usually is more reliable um, as a mechanism to underwrite against. Um, and a lot of these, you know, DAOs that actually also paying service DAOs or, you know, small businesses um, of the crypto world. Um, and this information is, is the same. It's represented either, you know, as a stream, as an invoice, as, as something else. 
So um, it can be utilized by both uh, business purposes or personal purposes. Awesome. Well, hopefully that uh, clarified uh, your uh, question. Uh, maybe uh, maybe I'll put you on the spot with, uh, with the final question, which is uh, when can we expect uh, the app to go live? <laughs> Great question. So uh, we're working hard with um, our initial set of partners for Alpha Launch uh, sometime around September. So uh, uh, please look forward to that. Uh, and you know, feel free to reach out to me on Telegram uh, as well. You can also email us at gm at huma.finance. Um, and we will soon uh, put up a website where you can also join our waitlist. Thank you. Amazing. Well, please uh, follow at Huma Finance on uh, Twitter to uh, keep up with uh, everything that they're doing. And uh, with that, thank you. thank you so much. And we are ready for our next panel. So as we kind of bring on all of our speakers, <clears throat> I am super excited to welcome and kind of start this panel. Uh, we're gonna talk about Web3 native business opportunities. There's a lot of stuff that we've already talked about that is possible with this new business ideas to just new ways to think about uh, using these protocols or just various protocols together. But uh, what we wanna do is focus on the ability to uh, honestly, just think about what is a on-chain company look like or the future of managing businesses on-chain look like. So for this amazing panel, I have uh, four amazing panelists. I have Christoph from Request Network, Tarun from CoinShift, Julian from Unlock Protocol, and Mike from Superfluid. So we'll bring them all uh, on stage and uh, get started. So welcome, everybody. Good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, Hello. And uh, before we dig in, I'm going to do the very boring thing, which is I'll have each of you introduce yourself just so that for the audience who doesn't know what you are doing, uh, they get some context. So uh, maybe starting with Mike, um, we'll let you know who you are, what you do, uh, and then we'll uh, just go next with, uh, with Julian Krista. Thank you, Kartik. It's a pleasure to see you again after all this time working with it Global. Um, I'm Mike or Michele. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Superfluid. I had the pleasure to meet Francesco and Miao, my co-founders, almost two years ago now, and build um, you know this kind of platform that allows value to be transferred in real time on uh, on chain with EVM network so far. Amazing, Julian. Hi, I'm Julian, and this UN founded Unlock, a company that's trying to build, or that actually has built a protocol for memberships, an easy way for creators, brands, communities of any kind to mint their own membership contract and then sell NFTs uh, in the form of membership cards. And these NFTs have an expiration date, which enables recurring revenues for businesses and, and creators. So, uh, hey, everyone, pretty excited to be here. I'm Tarun, founder and CEO of CoinShift. So we simplify crypto strategy management for DAOs and Web3 companies. So started out last year and yeah, I think pretty, pretty excited to be here. And my turn. Hello everyone, Christophe Lassuie. I'm an ex-CFO and uh, I'm CEO and co-founder at uh, Request Finance. And basically Request Finance is doing uh, invoicing and payments in uh, digital currencies. And uh, we have plans to uh, launch a superfood integration next month. Amazing. Um, well, so it looks like some alpha has already been dropped, um, but we'll, uh, we'll get started uh, with, uh, with our first uh, kind of very obvious question, which is, it's definitely a trick question, um, but are there, do we see actually businesses happening on chain or is it just speculation and, and people just trading NFTs and, and uh, putting money in DeFi and yield? Um, uh, I'll just kind of open it up. Anybody wants to take the first step, we'll, we'll kind of go in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can start. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, there is some uh, business uh, happening on chain. Uh, just for, I think, just for CoinShift, there was like 80 million, but Tarun will speak about that. Uh, for Request Finance, we've processed invoices for more than 200 million uh, so far. And so those, this is basically happening from our point of view for bill payments, expense reimbursements, and salary payments. And basically, the companies who are doing that kind of business, they are uh, of three different types. So the first one is crypto native companies and DAOs. Second one is uh, basically um, uh, professional services like uh, lawyers, uh, marketing agencies, software development companies. And the third one is uh, more Web2 companies transitioning to uh, Web3. Oh, amazing. Any, anyone, anyone else want to add something to this? And uh, if not, I have yeah, more. Yeah. Yeah, just to add on it, and all the categories I think Shofir like mentioned, uh, definitely like 
a lot of our users actually use request network as well so mm-hmm. like you know it's a combination of invoicing core payments mass payouts mm-hmm. like you know a lot of lot of things so uh, all the categories are definitely there and third party sort of you know reimbursements and all those things are really going on so a lot of crypto native companies and, and the good trend is like there are some companies which use us like they just want to accept payment from you know overseas right and they just want like a non custodial kind of solution so that they have like full control like how they should manage it so they they also are looking to really expand through on chain sort of payments and acceptance right so it's like a new new sort of set of market which is coming i would yeah, even go it. i mean further in the mm-hmm. consumer world where we're also seeing uh, we've unlocked a bunch of creators basically monetizing with the audience and their fans and people are paying to access their content or access their communities one thing that i think uh, some of you have experienced is tickets to conferences um, a lot of web3 events are now selling tickets through unlock and these are consumer uh, you know uh, people paying to access something so yes there is some business happening definitely i would i would i mean defer to uh, the other guys christof and tarun on the business side of things but i we're also seeing that on the on the consumer side of things which is really really exciting yeah and i, I would add even that uh, what we are speaking about basically activities that is happening on chain for businesses are resilient operations so meaning uh, it's not really depending on the market direction so whether there's a bull or bear market it, it's fine it's uh, growing anyway so for, i i think i'm speaking for all of us mm. No, I, it's a trend where we're actually what we have seen at Superfleet is that you know last year or the years before there was a lot more of this DeFi summer vibes or you know NFT speculation. But as the teams that operate in this industry start to grow and get funded and uh, start building you know essential pieces of the infrastructure that powers all these services, well, guess what? They have to pay salaries and raise invoices, and uh, you have B two B. value transfer but also b2c value transfer so mm-hmm. um it's interesting to look at the blockchain industry as something that is also robust over time and not just as fragile as market price is um so i guess that anyone anyone here had that experience over the last year or so and it's good to kind of dive into that i don't know if you guys have seen any trends in this direction like have you seen more business happening on chain everyone's talking about you know is this the year of the dao is this the year of of on chain payments what what do you think about it <laughs> that's a great question but uh, it's uh, de- uh, definitely the year where uh, the builders are um, basically standing out and uh, standing on top so the big builders exactly what, uh, like you were saying michele uh, the ones uh, the companies which have funding whether it's a dao a crypto native company or a, a startup from more uh, the web to world but what we are seeing is that they are even the web 2 companies they transition to web 3 for efficiency like uh, tarun was saying earlier and uh, and this is something that's going to stay for very long and uh, i think what also happened is like you know i think in the last sort of if we call this market a bear market i would say in the last sort of bear we were not having like you know boom of like really usdc or or stable crypto coins right and all the vcs or investors have like money majorly in btc or eth and that's why you know all the major the companies were not able to raise like specifically in a stable sort of form and that is it is highly coupled the growth of robust infrastructure and into into the speculation or or other things right but in the last few years it just you know highly decoupled from that and and that's why like you know two people just come to eth globals like hackathon and they can raise money that was not happening before and they can raise in stables and they can literally uh, you know run like a proper business on chain and once that is you know exponentially growing uh, i think that is like a tremendous sort of movement in this uh, sort of business on chain business native operations right and obviously dows is like a, i would say like a super set of all these things like you raise money and then you finally exit to the community so there's like a next level thing to just addition to that so i'll say like crypto startups all web three major institutions even investors you know all of these people are just now running businesses they they operate on top of crypto so that is something like really really good happened yeah and i mean you all mentioned usdc and stable coins so it's one of the major innovation not from this year obviously from i would say probably two or three years ago that's finally starting to completely uh pyramid everything that we do in crypto like most people deploying uh contract with unlock right now actually using USDC as the base currency they're not charging in eth or any of the 
volatile cryptocurrency, even like Matic on, on Polygon or others, they're charging in USDC. And so it's pretty clear that from a UX perspective, the predominance of stable coins now is definitely a big unlock and has given mm -hmm. businesses, but also consumers a lot more confidence in terms of trading things because there's obviously the technology that you have to, have to trust in, but also the currency that you're getting paid in or that you're paying in. Uh, and so seeing that is, is, is something massive um, and something that honestly is extremely, extremely bullish as a signal. Yeah, totally agree. And I would add that I'm surprised that we don't see a big other uh, stable coin that is not USD, USD pegged actually. So there are some other very big currencies in the world. And so far, a lot of businesses, even in Europe or in Asia, they are dealing with USDC. Mm. That's surprising. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm, uh, this is already a great panel because uh, my, my job is already reduced from asking questions or getting all of you to engage. So I'm, I'm glad here that I'm going to the next 30 minutes. Um, but, but I mean, like if I'm just kind of understanding all this right, and, and I did start off with this, this was a trick question, right? The answer is obviously yes. And the answer mm. here is like, what we're clearly seeing is that people are behaving like businesses on chain without actually needing a legal entity uh, for lack of a, a better reduction. And uh, that's kind of, first of all, just mind blowing because you can get to almost the same scale as a, a really successful company in, in tech or, or even any other part of non-tech world and never even have to deal with uh, <laughs> largely the real world. Um, and uh, it, that just still blows my mind. Uh, and so maybe the question kind of I have is um, <clears throat> all of you have, uh, customers that are in that category of companies that are not necessarily uh, like legal entities, they're directly mostly on chain. Have you kind of observed any kind of obvious patterns? Like are all of them just behaving like exact normal companies? Like, uh, yes, we have to do payroll. They have to uh, manage uh, accounts receivable and send invoices or, or send money. Um, is that just one-to-one? -one? Are we seeing something better? Like maybe to like seeing that for so many DAOs, like what's kind of been some highlights? Yeah, I think a lot of, uh, I will say like the needs, if you just compare from any company, like the needs are somewhere similar, but the experience and the things they want is like not entirely different, I would say. So uh, in short, like, uh, you know, if, if you are holding sort of a lot of crypto assets and now you want to run like a payroll, right? What a traditional sort of uh, system look like, you can just, you know, rely on certain bank and then you just schedule payments and you can just do a lot of things through the sort of simple database, right? And you want the same operation in crypto as well. But if you just say, you know, like we'll take the custody of the funds, then you want automation, they don't want it, right? So the, the basically, I think uh, all the operations are very similar, but the infrastructure and companies like ours request and, you know, like we, we need to build that infrastructure layer basically to support those operations because the fundamental layer is like self custody, right? You cannot just use the same sort of tools to provide like the same experience. And now the question is like how we can achieve the best experience plus building this, you know, ethos of right delegation, trustless or permissionless kind of systems so that we can then once we combine this, this entire system is far more, I would say superior than, than what we have seen in the, in the traditional sort of system. Right. So that is the common pattern we see. So a lot of times we also try to apply certain principles because we have our banking app as well as a coin shift. Right. And now we have as a coin shift, as a user, like as a platform as well. So we sort of, a lot of times we compare like, you know, what, what kind of experience we want, but not at the cost of taking the custody or taking the trustlessness. From the users. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, I guess like uh, maybe kind of put you on the spot yourself. Is that uh, the same kind of set of values and, and kind of principles that matter when you're thinking about adding more features to request? Or how, how does that kind of change um, anything for, for you? Um, no, I'd say um, so. Basically, how request finance works is you raise an invoice and you get paid on a on a wallet, but you can get paid on a wallet that is a custodial or non-custodial. You decide. Then the one who is uh, making the payment so far is paying from a non non-custodial uh, wallet. So he's uh, he, uh, right now the integration that we've got is, for example, integration with a Gnosis Safe. But uh, basically, uh, um, projects like uh, CoinShift seems super, super promising as well with an even better experience. So uh, basically, I, I would say I'm a bit uh, agnostic whether most of the uh, future users are going to do some self-custody. But the way I'm thinking about it for myself is I would not do 100% of one or the other. 
So basically, um, I don't know, like 50, 50, or like uh, trust some custodial services a little bit and also trust uh, the non-custodial uh, uh, wallet. Uh, which basically when you trust a non-custodial wallet, you trust yourself. Mm. Yep. <laughs> which, uh, which has some downsides because uh, there is no centralized risk or a single point of failure in some scenarios with the, not a lot of room. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a bad thing either. I mean, we've kind of been successfully doing that at scale. Um, and uh, it, it is in a way working for all of your customers uh, to, to some degree. And uh, but, but I agree. Uh, maybe one follow-up that I have for Tarun is... Um, Essentially, like you kind of commented on there, there's some new infrastructure or just infrastructure in general that we need. It is kind of the goal of the way you think about it that, hey, we want to make the experience just a one to one with how existing banking looks like for your customers. Or do you think there's more than that? Like, what's kind of the missing infrastructure pieces here for you? And um, how do you think about that? Yeah, so the mix of definitely both things. Like, there are certain things definitely you need to replicate as well, like, you know, invoicing is there where it's it's mandatory like you cannot miss invoicing right when you are building like a crypto banking layer so mm -hmm. this is there and then then you have to have like you know scheduling of payment these are the certain things you can bring but i think the interesting things which is cannot be possible and people need it is like you know some kind of kpi based performance kind of things right and and how will you really do that in a in a normal kind of database application it is not that easy so so these new experimental what do you mean by that? Like, uh, can you uh, share more? Yeah. yeah. So, so let's say, you know, you want to reward certain contributors based on some KPIs, right? And it should be trustless for those contributors now. So you don't mm -hmm. need to ask the admin, like, you know, I need this payment at this time. So I'll perform this and I'll get the money, right? So it's a trustless yeah. system, which is not possible, right? Mm -hmm. So I think those kind of new primitives will be there. So I, I think will be build, building more kind of, you know, those kind of primitives. And then there are certain things which is highly crypto native. So one example could be like right now, I just feel like, you know, multisig is highly operationally inefficient, right? It is built for security. It is built for like securing your funds, but it is not built for running your transactions every single day. Right. So for that, I think what we need is like more kind of modules on top of this base layer so that you can be operationally very efficient. And that, that is something like new kind of things you can do, like scoping out certain call data operations technically, right? Like this person can execute only these operations through multisig or, or some kind of delegation. So these kind of modules will be required and it is entirely new, right? So, so yeah. Yeah, that, that makes yeah. sense. And uh, to uh, to confirm what Tarun was saying, no, I'd add uh, that uh, basically, I think the, um, we're saying uh, the same thing, but basically there's, we can add the workflows to how the money uh, is sent to whom and even um, in which conditions. And basically the, the smart contract is allowing us to do that. So we could um, apply a smart contract uh, together combined with a uh, super fluid, for example, for streaming of payments, where basically there's total transparency and there is a trustless system for the, um, uh, the workers, the builders, the creators, to get paid in a very transparent setup. So if I take an example in the web two industry, basically when the client pays and a sales guy gets a bonus, basically all of this could be automated. If the client pays the bill, then the sales guys get a percentage. All this is automated, transparent. It's a, a clear workflow and it's managed by smart contracts. And this does not exist yet, but I think we are, we are building the first pillars. So step-by-step step, we're going we're gonna to go there. Amazing. Um, I do want to give uh, the other speakers a chance too. So, so what I'm hearing is, um, I don't know, I just meant like a, there's a, there's a lot more that I think we can add on to this. And so it's a really interesting topic. So uh, we're essentially, you know, we're starting off with, okay, let's try to get the basic building blocks of running a business on chain uh, up and going from what we already understand how any normal company would do. Uh, so you got stuff like invoicing, you got basic kind of payments, scheduling, managing uh, payroll, and just kind of, money flowing in and out. Those are simple building blocks that everybody needs. Um, and it's great that it's not custodial, but also it's fine if sometimes it's custodial because uh, um, uh, you can have the best of both worlds on where the asset is coming from. Um, that seems like usually the building blocks you need for running a normal business with a bank account and an illegal entity. Clearly there's a lot more we can do here. So maybe starting off with like what you think, Julian, like, what are some of these like new pieces that we can add on and how do we kind of supercharge this? 
Absolutely. What Christoph just said is, is very inspiring in that scenario because it means that when we think about companies on chain, we're very skeuomorphic. We're really trying to apply the same model that we have. When in practice, uh, I mean, if I'm a salesperson and I'm being paid by a company organization, but I'm also getting bonuses based on whether the customer is actually paying the company, and again, with air quotes, why do I actually need to be an employee in that scenario? Is, is, that, is that something that maybe I am just a member of a DAO in that scenario? And so that's kind of pushing us further down the idea of kind of, you know, theory of the firm where basically the company exists as a way to reduce friction uh, um, uh, between different people uh, inside and outside when actually the chain itself is the thing that actually reduces a lot of that friction. And right now, if I'm a salesperson, I need to believe or I need to trust that, yes, the customer is going to pay the company. And then the, the you know, the, the, the accounting inside the company is going to report that to the HR team that's going to pay me. Well, if this is all on chain, actually, there's no need for me to get that information from the HR team. There's no need for the, yeah, you know, the, the, the accounting team to actually report this thing. Uh, I can, as an employee, be immediately paid when indeed the customer pays for the product. So, so, that's to me one of the things that I'm excited about is like we're going to move beyond these kind of skeuomorphic phase where we're just replying, rebuilding the same models of on, off chain companies and organization to on chain and realizing that a lot of these is just scruff that we don't need anymore. Uh, and so that's going to reduce friction and, and kind of um, make things much smoother and much easier down the line. How does uh, Mark fit into this uh, equation for, yeah? Yeah, so the way the way we think a lot about these things is like uh, Unlock itself is a protocol for memberships. And we think that many, many businesses eventually will have a membership. So in, in that framing, maybe we're more like a 2.5 model in that scenario, where it's like we're still the same, you know, existing companies, the same media organization, the same creators, but they actually want to start thinking about, okay, what is it to be, what is it to have a membership as a core business model versus just a transactional one? So for media businesses, that means that, you know, I get... A membership and I access some of the content. I don't actually necessarily pay per article. I don't necessarily pay in, in the form of ads per article because like the, the ad is a transactional thing where I, I pay with my eyeballs in that scenario, but I'm moving to a different status uh, where, okay, now I'm a member of that organization. We also are chatting with a bunch of, you know, consumer goods product. We're thinking, you know what, it's very, very hard to do a customer acquisition, but uh, customer retention actually is something that can be improved a ton of times by having memberships as the core model. And so we all know that Amazon Prime is a very good example of this, where you know, if you're a member of Amazon, you're more likely, Amazon Prime, should I say, you're more likely to actually use them to ship your next good because you're, you're kind of this sunk cost uh, analogy where, you, I mean, energy, sunk cost system where you've already paid for the membership. Uh, why would you go some other store uh, to, to get free shipping uh, because you get it from them right away. Um, and we're discussing with some of the brands, uh, you might've seen that um, Starbucks in the US is gonna do NFTs for their loyalty points. That's a pretty obvious use case of, of the Unlock protocol in that scenario. Yeah, and also a perfect example of what membership looks like in, in general, right? And I think fundamentally, like in a way, employment is a way to think about membership. It's a either exactly right. you can imply. And we're seeing a bunch of DAOs actually use Unlock for their memberships, where instead of being kind of how much you own of the government service, like you have one and you pay every month, and, and the fact that you become a member of that community gives you access to certain benefits. And maybe the right to actually represent the company uh, in kind of sales deals, for example, in that scenario. Yeah, and actually, similarly, even benefits could be memberships, right? Like you can get all these various perks, even if you're employed in a different form or just directly on chain. And uh, exactly right, exactly right. Yes. Um, uh, Mike, do you can you think of anything else that we can use? <laughs> Well, quite a few, actually. Um, you know, I, I love what uh, what you said, Julian, about this idea of moving beyond this geomorphic, you know, phase of crypto, where we try just to mimic what is existing in TradFi. Um, we have seen that, you know, with every major transformational technology, where people just try to replicate the existing world into the new technology standard. But I'm extremely excited to see, um, you know, what can be done natively on Web3, right? So there are some properties of the chain that are really, really powerful, like transparency, uh, custody, self-custody, uh, but also uh, the kind of permanence or immutability and the fact that is, you know, normally good chains should be uptime 100%, um, so it never goes down, right? Um, and in this environment, you can see how most of our operations that generate friction in the world we're living in can be deferred to the chain. And in that case, they're not, they not only automated, but they're also taken care of independently from what the community or the organization or the company does. So, you know, you can envision services that are fully automated with very little friction or overhead, 
that can provide outstanding you know, value to the consumer or other businesses out there. And that's what I'm extremely excited personally. Uh, but of course, you know, looking at the world with a super fluid angle, um, I'm really excited about this idea of uh, interconnecting economical players such that we remove this kind of delays that are really generating a lot of cost and friction for the world, right? Uh, so if you're thinking about this idea of like payment failures or delays in, in payments in general, like the world is drawn on checks being sent out by mail, right? Now we have credit cards, we have a lot better infrastructure in, in the TradFi world, but what if you could just like have a situation where a company can get all the value um, it generates from revenues in real time from their consumers or, or the, the, their you know, clients in a way, and then redirect that to the suppliers almost as it comes in. So in that case, what, what happens is you can really reduce the amount of capital that you need in your own account, say, to then manage these delays to make sure you have the buffer to manage the cash flow. And that means that if you take the world economy and then you kind of reduce the buffer or the capital, the working capital needed to just make the company work across the board, can you imagine how much capital we can free up and put at work building better technologies for addressing things like climate change or you know uh, those major problems humanity is facing today? So that's what makes me tick uh, with this idea of Web three, right? You know, we can have someone paying a membership through Unlock that goes to a business that operates, uh, you know, maybe in a super fluid fashion. So with super fluid streams in real time, and that value goes directly to someone working for that business, that then is a collaborator that is being invoicing via request network or, you know, using the management payroll from, from the kind of shift world and try to connect the dots such that the person has that money ready to invest in real time through say ricochet exchange. And that goes back into some sort of investment world eventually or some LP position that then fuels the next company that's going to innovate, you know, and then, and then this cycle continues over and over. So this idea that you can basically inflate the economic value of a state or, or an economy without adding more capital to the mix, but just using the existing capital in a more efficient way really makes me excited. Oh, that's amazing. And uh, I was going to just open it up for everybody else. Like there's clearly a lot of ways to do this thing in real time with just not just streaming payments super fluid altogether like how, how do you kind of see this changes what you're doing at your core maybe, maybe if, I, go for yeah, it I can, yeah so i think like uh specifically what we're trying to build as like you know the the first layer is like core treasury layer one kind of system right right now the treasury infrastructure is does not even exist uh, we, we have like, we're calling like, you know, multisig wallet as a treasury sort of infrastructure, right? Or so that infrastructure layer needs to exist. And then basically how we see this is like all the, any kind of, any kind of, you know, core primitives to those treasury layer can be automated. Uh, and then it can be run like, you know, real time. So payroll is one aspect, but we we are very interested in things like where, you know, our employees are sort of, you know, getting the money and then they are just doing like a DCA on on ricochet right and then uh, it is already we are already doing that right so it is not like these are assumptions people really want to do something like that and that is something like you know we want to bring more these kind of primitives which can literally automate the entire workflows in a very crypto native way and super fluid just you know uh, do that like out of the box and and uh, only like you know what I would love to add on top of it is like the entire experience of you know uh, interacting with the current system is not that great right now, and and we just want to make it like really really seamless so that from even you know the DAO and Min side or the delegate side it should be super seamless to manage the flow rate, editing the flow rate, or they can just come for the right operation. Otherwise, as you know, Mike was saying, like they shouldn't be worried about like any other thing, right? For the 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 payment will flow themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is. This is definitely we are looking, and then on the asset management aspect as well, uh, we want to move forward onto that as well, where you have certain kind of vaults where, you know, one wallet is sort of generating certain yield, and that yield is redirected to the payroll vault directly, right? So you and and, and it is like you know harvesting directly, and when you are paying from that vault, like you don't need to worry about like I need to come back and do all those things, right? It is like directly flowing, so all your treasury operations are automated. So yeah. Uh, ju just an idea. Uh, actually, we did not speak about it, but 
I think there's no use case about paying a rent in streaming, or maybe Michele, you're aware of that. Because uh, actually that would really make sense. You get your salary in a stream way and you pay your rent in a stream way. Uh, and th th that would be fun. Michele, are you aware of such a project? Yeah, there's there's been a few. Um, cool. And someone's doing it more like from a hackathon point of view and others are doing oh. it more like a business. So what's interesting about it is that we, we managed to stream to an NFT so that if the NFT changes hands, the stream redirects automatically. So if the NFT say is your house or is a parcel of land in Decentraland and you're renting that out to someone, the moment you sell that to someone else, the rent redirects automatically without you having to you know, ask someone to send a stream to someone else and redirect the stream manually, which is part of that automation we're discussing before where you're basically you are just delegating to the chain all the kind of business operations to some degree. So yeah, that, that is one of the key use cases for sure. And I'm really looking forward to seeing something like that happening, for example, in the B2C market as well. Like for example, I don't know if Unlock has looked into this as well to like have memberships like on streams. Um, I think we were talking about it and you and Francesco were talking about it as well, but that would be amazing to see. And yeah, I'm just looking yeah, forward. Yeah, I think there's to... an ongoing project of integrating the both uh, where basically you're right. Like the as long as you pay, you've got the membership and the minute the stream ends, the membership expires basically, which I think is a very, very brilliant integration. Um, I want to jump on that actually, because uh, one point that uh, I think uh, Tarun made earlier is like, one of the core ideas of web and blockchain is the composite, the web three and blockchain is composability. It's the idea that these things could all work together, kind of Lego bricks versus kind of the platform monolithic approach was like, okay, it's you go rely on this thing for everything in your business. Um, I think businesses have realized like on when it comes to kind of digital at this point, they're very, very reliant on a very small number of actors. Like if you sell goods online, well, you know what? Your ads are all driven by Google and Facebook. And then your shipping might actually be all powered by, by Amazon. And these things are scary when it comes to doing businesses. Like you really don't want to have this much reliance on a small number of actors. And the, one of the opportunities of Web3 in many ways is to actually say, no, 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 you don't have to rely on, on platforms like this. You can be using open protocol uh, like, I mean, um, super fluid is a, is a good, example, good example of this. Um, and, and what's I think even beyond that is like, not only you can use these open protocols that would not be kind of rugged uh, under your feet uh, if things change, but also you can collectively manage them and co-own them, and which is kind of also kind of a very novel aspect. Like I, I know a lot of businesses that are, you know, selling things through Amazon or through Facebook really want to have a say on the product roadmap of these companies and say, no, 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 you Facebook, this new kind of way you approach pages is not the right way. We're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna struggle with this. At this point, this is very much kind of a impossible, like basically every business that relies on these platforms is at the mercy of these platforms. Uh, but with Web3 and protocols, um, not only they're using open things, decentralized things that you know are immutable or at least have a clear mutability path, uh, basically, but also they could collectively own them, which I think is even one step beyond and one step further. Absolutely. Um, I was going to say, uh, we're, we're getting a couple of comments and questions from the audience too. So if you have any other questions for a speaker, uh, please just type them in the chat and uh, we'll uh, we'll be able to ask them here. Um, no, it's, it's a really, really good point too, because um, I feel like in addition to seeing in a way the basic building blocks being offered on chain, like you're essentially what you're doing is you're you get to play with the granularity, right? Like if I want to send a wire or some deposit, there's usually a minimum required. Uh, when you do paychecks, they do every two weeks or every month. Uh, and you kind of now have a per second, if not even less than that uh, as a time interval. And you get to do a lot more creative things when you can actually do this thing by milliseconds or seconds or just any denomination that's as granular. And we've already kind of, with blockchains, we already kind of got to the point where you can now send money up to like a billionth of, of a dollar, uh, if not longer or more. Um, and uh, that becomes more creative because now you have more service here to kind of do interesting things and yeah, like it would be amazing if your salary is streamed by by the second and same thing for a membership. If I have to commit to an annual membership for X dollars and I decide to stop it three days in or 99 days in, um, you can prorate that. And, and those are just not easy to do in reconciliation in, in traditional SaaS or any other model. And I think Superflow just makes that world amazing. And beyond that, you can even automate what happens. I mean, the thing that I love about Superflow is yeah, like, you can just, automate sure. things. Like, because, I mean, SaaS businesses, you know, uh, expiring cards is a nightmare for them. It's like, oh, fuck, these guys got this expiry. I have to now spend like an hour on the phone to try to get them to update because they forgot about it. And at the same time, the fact that they forgot about it is kind of a cool thing because they paid without worrying too much. 
But now that they're going to remind them that we exist, are they going to stop paying? And so I know there's a ton of businesses for which kind of it's a challenge, but the fact that you can automate all of these things on train and actually don't waste a dollar trying to call back a customer, it's like, hey, you stop paying, this is going to stop you know, working for you, is a massive, massive opportunity. Absolutely. And uh, and one thing that kind of just stood out to me with what you said, Mike, before is uh, like, one, like, I, at first of all, there's way more room to explore what new Web3 kind of building blocks are here for running it in operations on on-chain. But like, even if you assume that there's nothing new to be invented, which is definitely not the case, um, there is still a massive opportunity to increase kind of anything from what you can capture in value to just the value you can generate um, for just the existing building blocks. And, and kind of one obvious example, which comes from a comment from, uh, from the chat is, the fact that all these things are composable, interconnected, and, and, and inspectable on chain, you have so many new benefits that you don't get in the real world. Now I can basically design, let's say, a tax management system that just understands everything that's going on. It can fully make sense of everything without me having to connect something or having a custom integration. Uh, and you simply just get to expand the size of like what you can achieve or how you can actually use that information for better decision making or just better efficiency. Uh, and we haven't even seen that world yet. And that's just, uh, even if you invent nothing new from here on, uh, you can still have a massive improvement uh, in existing processes. And I think that to me is like the, probably the most exciting part, uh, especially as we do a lot of logistics here <laughs> on our end. This is, why would you not want that? Um, and uh, there's like 50 more things you can do on that one. Yeah, so, I, don't think, I don't think accountants will, will like me or at least what I have to say now, but the fact that you can, if you, have, if you were to have visibility on the revenue streams of a business, um, or even a consumer, that means you can pay tax in real time and that the amount you are going to pay tax is very transparent. So I can imagine how governments would love the opportunity to charge taxes in real time, for example, on a stream so that part of your business operations are transferring directly to the government with a downside of them to have to be transparent as well in a way, right? So that makes it fairer for everybody. Now there's no real cheating, but then all the information is available and I guess the public can make better decision because of the visibility they get. So, I mean, we can bring this to the kind of extreme, but we don't have to. The point is there is efficiency everywhere you look um, when you're using this type of infrastructure. And I think Web3 is just a matter of time. It's gonna, it's gonna just unlock it over time. Yeah, the way I see it is uh, it's super promising. But I, uh, basically, it's difficult to imagine that the authorities are going to set up this uh, uh, streaming uh, tax uh, system. But uh, I'd see first uh, some uh, kind of solidarity tax system that would happen like at a more or less global level just for uh, certain causes that we could do on some transactions and uh, voluntarily. And uh, this is something that could happen tomorrow morning. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, since we've opened attacking on accountants, um, they'll, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, one piece here is that, like, there are so many things that exist just because there's a lack of transparency, right? Um, the fact yeah. that I can generate a anywhere from code to manage the most amount of cases, whether they're edge cases or just common conditions, to have a consistent system that just works across anywhere from jurisdictions to, to standards, like, you will effectively can... Um, get to a point where these things are generated on their own and forget, like, even if you don't get to the point where you're paying real-time tax, uh, I can, I can foresee some, some friction on that one, uh, from some government sides, but, uh, the fact that you can still generate what it is, um, automatically, even if it's real time or, or even if it's static is still a massive improvement that just is a painful process for every single company here. Uh, once a year, you got to figure out what transactions are happening on chain, what are interconnected sort of swaps in there, you can fix this <laughs> and uh, and sort of enable a whole new frictionless sort of more granular world. So I think that's, uh, to me, already an improvement uh, from this world. Yeah, yeah definitely. And the, the, uh, the reason why accountants are actually preparing books, the reason why bookkeeping exists is so that we pay taxes. So uh, basically, you know what I mean. <laughs> accountants would uh, not exist anymore with that kind of job, uh, but uh, would do some things which are probably a little bit more interesting. No, you're right. Uh, this is interestingly uh, a perfect example of uh, cutting out the middleman. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> we've mm. seen that on the finance side for existing systems. We've seen that on, on payment side. And now there is like the, 
the processing piece that it's still incumbent. Um, I know we're kind of getting uh, close to our time on the panel. So, so maybe uh, one thing that I think would be interesting uh, to end on would be uh, kind of seeing what you're excited about. Like obviously all of you are working on open platforms um, and if you kind of can have anyone from requests to ideas for people to kind of build on top of, like what do you think is like top of that list and what would you like to see more creative exploration on? Um, I'll, I'll kind of maybe start with Julian because I think we have a lot of ideas on how memberships can actually be you know, get everywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a big segue from, from what we discussed, but I think uh, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, stable coins as being one of major innovation. I think we're now at a point where we have all of these EVM chains and I think we're all uh, building on these. Um, I know the bridge topic is a contentious one, but I think it's also very, very hard for end users and businesses to at some point manage, you know, five, six, seven, eight balances of tokens across different chains. And so thinking about a world that would be abstracting away some of the complexity of being on multiple EVM chains, where as a user, I pay, I start a stream from one chain and I know the stream is going to go through a bridge onto something else, wherever that something else is is something that I'm really, really excited to see. Uh, I know there's a ton of teams that are working on this, but for me, that's the next big unlock haha, uh, in the uh, in the ecosystem. It's like, how can we actually work? Um, uh, how can our work, our protocol abstract away the complexity of a multi-chain world? Um, and and I, I think it's going to be through, um, you know, protocol specific bridges rather than kind of agnostic bridges. Um, um, and, and hopefully we'll see that uh, happening in the next few months. And so if you guys are working on anything fun uh, on that front, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear about this. Amazing. Arun, do you have uh, anything you want to add? I think 100% aligned with like Julian. We just feel like a lot of, you know, our customer base is just setting up accounts on different chains for specific reasons. Maybe they're moving their protocol there. They have a lot of treasury assets there, right? And the most friction is like they can't between multisig, like they can't between the money between multisigs in a very seamless way, right? It's very painful. So we are also sort of looking for these kind of solutions which can work out of the box. And I think uh, like protocol based sort of, uh, you know, right efficient sort of bridges will make a lot of sense for us and, you know, front end like SARS like can, can integrate in a very seamless. So I'm pretty excited on that. But one other thing I'm pretty excited is definitely on the layer two of specifically on Ethereum, because previously, like, you know, uh, we, we all know, like, you know, other than Ethereum, it was very difficult to really trust any other sort of chain where, where you can just park some funds, right. Uh, with the security of Ethereum. So I think the, the major DeFi is growing in the layer twos. And that is something like, you know, we are very, very excited about to grow. Maybe we'll build a protocol specifically on layer two, right? And just like, you know, uh, Superfluid did that. So, so it is, it is really, really, uh, you know, appealing to us. I'm very excited. No, absolutely. Um, Christoph, I'll, I'll let you go next and then. Uh, yeah, ju just in a few words. Uh, I'd say basically, there are many innovative solutions, many opportunities of things that we can integrate. And there are many other that we could create and that we don't have yet. But if, um, if we can have a next step where uh, the next uh, tools and the net, next apps that we build are actually about uh, execution, making them happen. So for example, build on top of Superfleet, build on top of uh, the great projects which already exist and make them happen and help the Web2 uh, economy to convert to Web3, that would be really nice. Um, and, uh, and further innovation can happen a little bit later, that would be fine. Yeah, you're right. I think. Uh... Like there's a, there's a, we've kind of essentially been talking about just how do we exist and just do everything in Web3 side, but there's a clear argument that it's a much bigger world that we need to move to Web3 to be able to do these things efficiently on chain with the new features. Um, and that's a really good point that was, uh, was missed. And uh, when, when I'm just kind of processing what Julian and Turin said, uh, uh, you're effectively talking about having different currency bank accounts, which is still a problem even in the real world side. Uh, even if it's the same asset existing on different chain behaves like a secondary account in a different currency and you have different properties there that you have to deal with. And uh, I don't think you saw that at all in, in the, the Web2 world uh, or in the banking world. So uh, I actually am personally excited for that to just be solved where we just have a all in all solution that just doesn't let us spend any mental brain power on thinking about where it's coming from. Uh, we'll, we'll end with Mike. Um, I'll let you uh, kind of share your thoughts there too. Yeah, I was just uh, wanted to say that what you just said is something that Tarun is addressing with this ability to manage multiple safe um, and also multiple networks with their new V2. So that's very exciting. And we want to try to use it as well, see how, how it was. 
Um, for me, I'm, I'm really excited about, um, you know, all the building blocks needed to power a real a, a Web3 native economy coming together. So you have seen, you know, invoicing, treasury management, uh, membership management, uh, subscription management. I think, you know, we just miss some of the understanding of how to manage crypto and putting some oil on the wheels to make sure that the mechanics are fine so we don't have to go crazy chasing, you know, C-level executives of a project to sign a multi-sig transaction every other day just to pay someone because they made a bounty and they deserve to be paid in time, right? So these bits and pieces are coming along. Um, and, you know, even some of the backend infrastructure now needs to have high SLAs, right? And when the service level agreement reaches enterprise grade um, and there is no friction anymore, then we will reduce so much inefficiency uh, that will unlock a lot of time for everybody. Um, more specifically, I'm excited about how uh, you know real-time value transfer would play on top of that once that's ready. Because with automation, um, you know, assuming that all the friction is removed by the chains and by the tools that we're building, then kind of real-time finance would hypercharge all of that. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing like how this could uh, could unfold over time with uh, real-time finance value transfer. It's a great time to meet this year. Um, um, no problem at all. It's like I am uh, myself on one of the live streams. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I mean, that makes total sense. And, and if anything, I think Superfluid sort of reduces that friction with, in a way, having a more optimistic, what we go ahead with that. And if something is not right, you get to sort of put a pause on that um, instead of taking anywhere from the full penalty to going through the decision if it needs to be, uh, to be reversed or, or stopped. Um, so hopefully that was super informative for everybody else on, on, uh, on the audience side. And uh, if anything, we're, I'm just gotten more excited about running a whole company without having a legal entity, uh, and I uh, can't wait for more building blocks to, to exist so we can really think about that world just being our default. So, uh, thanks again, everybody. And, uh, we're looking forward Thank to you. In future events too. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Amazing. Thank All right. Bye-bye. We are ready for our next talk. So you kind of got a preview of all the building blocks that we think are, are needed or we need to in a way perfect, but uh, that is a leaves still a lot, a lot of room open for what we think we can do with the world of streaming money. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Miao, who's going to talk about what is upcoming in the Superfluid protocol. So welcome to uh, stage and uh, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Kartik. Um, now to start, let me share the screen. Yeah, thanks everyone to join our first Superfluid Reactor Summit. So uh, I'm Miao. Um, on my GitHub, it's uh, Hairwolf, and uh, I'm CTO and co-founder of uh, Superfluid Protocol, Superfluid Finance. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what's next to the Superfluid Protocol. Right, so Maybe let's first look at uh, Superfluid in real, real mirror. So uh, how it was started. So exactly 440 days ago, probably 441 now after a few hours, um, we deployed to Polygon. Um, that was a transaction. And then we had two packages for builders to start with and Deployed then also to XDAI, uh, both of the network I changed the name. If you if you remember, uh, it was called Matic, and uh, now it's called Polygon, and it was XDAI. Now it's called a Gnosis Chain. Right, so that's how we got started. So how is it today? Let's look. Uh, now we have a uh, vibrant development activities in the Mono Repo. So we have a lot of forks on twenty seven. We have a lot of stars. And uh, we have uh, quite consistent commits to our uh, dev branch. So, and uh, our smart contracts project is also evolving. So we, ha we have just added uh, the access control list to our CFA, uh, constant flow agreement. And uh, we also switched to hard hat for functional testing. Uh, we also integrated with uh, Foundry for additional fuzzing testing. Uh, we recently, actually yesterday, also introduced HotFuzz, a new pro, uh, a new test framework for superfluid applications. That means your super apps also. 
So you can now use uh, something called a hot pass, which uses echidna from uh, 12 bits for even more sophisticated uh, uh, fuzzing testing, right? So uh, now we have more than two packages. We have uh, new and better packages, right? JS SDK is being deprecated. You should really switch to SDK core. And we have also a uh, Redux uh, flavor of the SDK. Um, we now put all the network support on subgraph. Uh, we have a quite good uh, um, support uh, there and, uh, and hot files recently. And we also have some, something called a spec Haskell. I'll talk about that later. Uh, now we have also more, much, much, many, many more examples, right? So there is even an archive folder now because there's just too many, uh, which is good. Um, there are more docs. So if you haven't visited our docs, go to docs.scoofly.finance, you'll see the protocol overview, uh, developer section, things about Sentinel and all the peripheral resources you could find. Um, and we also have continued contributions from uh, our community, right? So uh, here are the badges for our uh, contributors. Some of them actually joined even our uh, team full-time. Um, we're always committed to contributing back to the community, right? So we have pull requests to the Truffle suit, for example. We have pull requests to the Truffle plugin verify. Uh, we have issue reports and technical feedback to the graph. And uh, we have also pull requests to uh, Akina, for example. Uh, many, many more, actually. And uh, we adhere to the open collaboration and free and open source philosophy. So that's our... Uh, part of our uh, way of working. Um, as a result, we have continued usage from builders. Um, so now, if you, uh, according to GitHub, we have uh, 298, almost 300 repository, depending on our Ethereum contracts projects. And uh, there's also continued download from our NPM, uh, of our NPM packages from uh, uh, NPM.js. And uh, also, we are live on many more chains now, right? So we are just recently launched on Avalanche. Uh, a while ago, we also launched on Layer 2s, Arbitrum, uh, Optimism, uh, more to come. Um, also, we have uh, community flows going up. So that's so far a figure that I can share. So what's coming next to Superfluid? Uh, more networks, of course. So uh, well, first, in order to do that, we're, we're gonna enable a uh, minimal deposit. So that's only for networks with high fees. We're talking about things like Ethereum mainnet and some of the layer twos also have uh, relatively high fees compared to Polygon and uh, Gnosis chain, for example. Uh, we're trying to make it more profitable for sending out closing the micro streams, meaning that those streams are, have really, really small uh, value and uh, deposit, and uh, with minimum deposit, that will make it a slight more profitable. Um, we're also targeting for more community uh, engagement. Uh, so we have now a framework deployment guide updated many times, and each time we go to new network, it's always uh, our community member deploy to the new network. Uh, we also make uh, have made the deployment of ERC20 wrapper uh, easy. Uh, you, uh, most uh, for or most of the network, we just need to go to uh, one of the ether scan like um, scanner and uh, click a few button. Then there is a ERC20 wrapper of super token. Um, we're gonna create more, uh, uh, gonna do more work on the custom uh, super token templates uh, for the for you to create your own pure super tokens. And uh, if you need the more custom features, you should also look into it. And uh, we'll do more work on that to make your uh, custom super token creation process more smooth and uh, um, sleek. Um, we're gonna also support uh, a token lists um, standard. Uh, uh, one of the frequent asked questions, how can I know, how can we know um, uh, the list of super tokens there are used? So we're gonna, uh, work on a bit more, making that uh, available on the token lists. Um, the next big thing for us is to do some formalizations. So there will be a uh, yellow paper 
Um, so we'll be citing existing papers, right? So things like uh, existing EIPs, things like existing research on the theory of uh, money and payment system. And we'll keep a fairly high standard of intellectual honesty. So we'll be reusing existing terminologies and trying to generalize uh, existing framework if possible. Not just to flag, just for the sake of it. Right? It's not about your idea versus my idea, right? And uh, also highlight the original, but at the same time, we also want to highlight the original idea and the contribution from superfluid money in the process. So, um, the yellow paper will also use a technique uh, called uh, embedding the specification where it will be written in literal, literate hard scale. Right? This is one example. They're defining something called uh, decaying flow agreements. And the benefit of doing so is that uh, we'll have well-defined terminologies, which basically equivalent of saying well-defined types. And uh, we also define some of the language in a more rigor definitions, which is also equivalent to say, have testable properties. And uh, the idea of super, super fluid protocol, we actually become a Haskell program even. Right, so the whole process will make it a sound platform for research topics. So what are the research topics? So we'll, we'll be experimenting a bit more exotic uh, agreements, things like uh, decaying flow, uh, general distribution, step flow, this kind of thing. Uh, we also uh, explore it a bit more uh, regarding different uh, solvency models. Um, currently, our system is uh, so called uh, using so called a buffer based solvency. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, the, the, the concept of buffer if you have uh, programmed on our protocol. Um, but there are other techniques such as syncing the time as opposed to using buffer, etc. So money units models can be also a topic to be explored. Um, we're all familiar with account token model. Uh, that's quite widely used on EVM. Um, in fact, a de facto one. Um, there might be also a chance for we to make an EU TXO model, right? So that's a research topic. And uh, composability models, right? So we use, we use extensively callbacks to implement uh, super apps, but there are other techniques to do composability perhaps using state syncing as opposed to uh, synchronous callbacks, right? All those can be uh, good research topics. So we also, uh, so the work done in the, in the formalization uh, will provide a very solid reference for additional superfluid money implementations, but what it can be. EVM superfluid V2, a non-EVM system, or superfluid enabled uh, blockchain itself, right? So these are all the open question. Um, so additionally, we're also gonna develop a uh, protocol validator. So it will become a simulation environment for new ideas and concepts. And uh, with that, it can also provide a very good functional specification testing tool for new implementations, right? So you can visualize the account uh, account balances during the te during a test case, for example. Um, but at the same time, we also need to do some deep refactoring of our existing EVM implementation. We'll deliver the fun functional style agreement refactoring. So we we'll split the pure code from the side effects. Uh, side effects, we're talking about things like reading protocol parameters from governance, uh, EVM storage operations, callbacks to super apps, this kind of thing. Um, in doing so, it will make it also easier for formal verifications of uh, each component, especially each agreement. And it will make ways for more feature development, right? So um, another thing we will be doing is called a token-centric interface. We're phasing out of the usage of uh, a core agreement. Um, you might be familiar with if you have done some development on Superfluid. So that means you'll be using more uh, idiomatic token dot kind of interface, right? So for example, it'll be token dot create flow, it'll be token dot update flow, token dot delete flow. And uh, 
the IDA, the Instant Distribution Framework, you, have, uh, you might be familiar with, will be become a uh, multi-purpose index, right? So you'll be using token.create index instead. As a subscriber to the index, you will do like token.subscribe to index, token.approve index. And uh, you might be familiar with the IDA that, that it does distribution instantly, right? So it then it become token.distribute to index. What about something called token.update distribution flow rate of index, right? Very wordy, mouthful, but uh, it's something called GDA I will introduce shortly. And uh, uh, something about uh, decaying flow agreement, right? Token dot update decaying flow rate of index, right? So the index really become a multi-purpose uh, instrument for publisher to uh, change, uh, um, influence balances of all its subscribers, providing more uh, design surface for your uh, superfluid applications. So all we are doing here is trying to complete the jigsaw, a jigsaw puzzle. So that's so-called uh, superfluid payment uh, modalities matrix. What does it mean? So uh, payment before superfluid money, right? There's only one, that's one-to-one -one and instant. For example, ERC-20, everyone familiar with, right? So sending from one account to the other instantly. Payment with superfluid money, right? So we have a matrix here. So we have one-to-one -one and we have one-to-n from one dimension. Uh, from the other dimension, we have an instant versus streaming. So one-to-one -one instant, uh, we have also a name now called a transferable balance agreement. One-to-one um, -one streaming, that's basically constant flow agreement or the decaying flow agreement. One-to-an instant, that will be the IDA. So it will be GDA with instant distribution, AKA IDA, we're all familiar with. And uh, one-to-an streaming, that will be GDA with constant or decaying flow. But it's not there yet, but it will be there at some point. So so-called GDA is general distribution agreement. It is a multi-purpose index with instant distribution, with constant flow, with decaying flow, or something else. So beyond the corporate code wars, um, there's also many things uh, ongoing. Um, one of the object, uh, one of the, uh, the goal is to make the Sentinel more profitable. Right, so we'll make the Sentinel more than, more than just for solvency protection from hostile actors. We want, we want to add some civilian services to the Sentinels. So for example, uh, closing stream for you by uh, end date, right? Uh, I mentioned that we had a feature now called the uh, access control list. So basically you allow a third party uh, to close the stream for you or even update stream for you. Uh, how about a wrap, wrap up more underlying token for you when your balance is running low? Right. So these are the civilian services we can add to Sentinel in a decentralized manner. Also, we want to add more power to our subgraph uh, uh, implementation to the protocol. So the problem we try, uh, we're facing at the moment is that superfluid distribution index is too powerful. Um, because an index can change balances of all its subscribers. A subgraph indexer, unfortunately, cannot scale as much as its current, uh, in its current uh, architecture. So we're working with uh, the graph team to find a solution to tame it. Uh, we're also adding more features to the SDKs, right? That's, that means uh, the SDK core, the uh, SDK Redux. So I would uh, call for everyone to be part of it. Um, so in order to join this uh, journey, uh, we have a bi-weekly protocol public forum. Uh, it's every when, um, it's on Wednesday, 2.30 GMT. If you join, if you're interested, join our Discord and ask for invitations. Um, also check out our, our, our bounties on uh, Moon Repo. Uh, there's a tag called Bounty. Uh, also can check out our, our bug bounty uh, for smart contracts on Immunify, a shout out to them. And uh, if you want to join us full-time, there's also jobs available on jobs.superfluid.finance. 
So well, that's it. Uh, thank you. And uh, the slide source code you can also find from our wiki page. So that's it. Thank you. Amazing. Oh, well, thank you so much for uh, kind of going through basically the, I think, uh, early look in that roadmap of, roadmap of how we think uh, money will change. Um, maybe just a couple of questions I have on uh, sort of how you're kind of thinking about this thing and also what the learning's been over the last uh, 440 days. Um, my, my kind of first one is like, have you, like, how do you kind of decide to focus on a new uh, chain? Like, is that just like we, we can just deploy the same code there? Or do you think you see like a different demand coming in from those users and that have different needs on different kind of destinations? Like what kind of goes on and what are some like observations that you've had from uh, using different chains? Yeah, so currently we are, uh, we only have an EVM implementation, right? So, and we don't necessarily decide. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we will call for deployment and we'll wait for it for the, a community member deploy first. So it's more of a community driven at the moment for EVMs. Um, and uh, on non EVM, it's more, more of the research side. So it's uh, it's not, not nowhere near the deployment. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, um, that clarifies the other question I was going to ask. But uh, I think one question from the audience is uh, uh, yeah, if you can uh, send us a link to the slides, we'll share that with the, the chat and everybody there. And then we'll also uh, kind of explore that, put that on our Discord for anybody who's hacking and uh, wants to see that same thing. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, giving us a little look on the next version release of Superfluid. Thank you. And with that, we are ready for our next talk. And I'd like to bring on Mike back on stage and uh, give us uh, an overview and some of his thoughts on the interconnected Web3 economy. We've already kind of gotten some sneak peeks around what we think is that world and how we think it's gonna evolve. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask him to turn on the video and say hi and uh, kick us off with this talk. Welcome. Hey, hi Kartik again. So um, yeah, I'd like to talk about this idea of the interconnected web free economy. Uh, let me just try to share my screen and if anyone can let me know if you guys can see anything. Everything is good. I'm just trying to put it full screen. What do you see? Yep. Brilliant. So yeah, I'd like to talk about the idea of having an interconnected Web3 economy. It's not something that we hear every day in crypto. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to try to explain it. So I'll try to explain it by um, telling how inefficient our current kind of financial system is. So I'm sure that everyone here relate to this idea or this feeling of having to queue uh, at an ATM just to take some cash out to make a payment when you maybe are in a hurry or you want to grab something quick at the store. So, um, you know, this is one of the best ways to understand how inefficient our financial system is and was. Um, of course, you also had issues where maybe you were ordering a delivery or some sort of food online and you got a kind of failed transaction. And sometimes it's because, of course, you didn't have enough funds on your card, but sometimes it's for other reasons. And so this is a very frustrating experience. Um, other times you are maybe someone who is like working in uh, the web free economy and, you know, you are just like a freelancer or a contributor and uh, you're just waiting to get paid maybe as a UX UI designer for some design you have done. And it's just a business that pays you late because, for example, there is an internal process which needs to happen for clearance or just even to understand your details or you know, your bank account details to send the money to you. So there are a lot of inefficiencies in kind of the fiat um, in financial system that we can experience every day, even though we have been innovating so hard around money. So, for example, you know, the world has changed a lot from sending checks over email to being able to put your credit card details into a website and have a subscription chart to, to your account every, every month or so. So even for like this world that we have innovated so, so far, so that is somewhat seamless and abstracted, even in that kind of SaaS subscription model, there are a lot of inefficiencies, um, both for the consumer or the one who's actually paying that has to, for example, input the data and then making sure the card is not, is not expired and if it's expired to renew it, but also for the merchant. Um, so if you are like a SaaS company that has hundreds or thousands or, or even millions of users, um, even just a small percentage of these payments failing is a massive headache for you. 
So to put some numbers to this, um, let's just look at a report by Deloitte that was published in July 2019 called Economic Impact of Real-Time Payments. So all the businesses interviewed for this report, um, you know, 31% of them say that their business would be willing to pay some type of fee to ensure they receive all payments immediately. So it's, it's a massive um, interest uh, from, from this kind of inter instant payment, let's say. But also, if we look a little bit deeper into the report, we see that you know, this low speed of payments um, is somewhat holding up capital in the system. So there is a lot of inefficiency in having to deal with delays when it comes to payment processing. Um, it's not only just on the operational side, but it's also on kind of the social side. So you know, real-time payments uh, would make financial services more accessible and attractive to consumers. And also they could potentially help consumers budgeting because the less delays, the less variability, the less variability, the more certainty and, and hence it's easier to plan around your personal finances. So all of these are real, real problems for both the consumers and, and the business world. Um, but you know, have we innovated around this? Have we tried to make payments instant uh, from a fiat traditional financial system point of view? Yes, we did. And of course, in some countries, uh, we have seen an uptake of instant payments, for example, in Korea and the United Kingdom, and in others, a little bit less. So looking at this chart, you can see, for example, the uptake of uh, instant payments. Let's just call them instant because real time doesn't really fit what these are. So here you can see how Korea, for example, have really started to use mobile wallets or even um, you know, fast payments that are bank to bank transactions that are instant so that your money gets to your wallet as it's sent. So there is no time delay between when someone presses send and when you receive it, or just a few seconds. So there is no you know, days or hours of delay. So we have done something, but it's not probably enough. And this is still very nascent. It's a new industry, the instant payment industry is like not been, been there for over like 20 or 30 years. So if we, if we try to, look at how much our society has evolved over the last, say, 10 years, and we look at how the payments have evolved, we see a little bit of a lag. Uh, let me try to give you an example here. So imagine that you, know, you are in your 20s and you want to watch a movie on a Saturday night. How the old world worked um, is that you had to go to a shop and try to rent a DVD, for example, if you didn't have the movie at home. And, you know, everyone here that is, you know, 25 or 30 and above knows Blockbuster. And, you know, you really had to go to the shop. So you have to go get it. Um, then maybe you wanted to see, say, Matrix. And Matrix, maybe there were five copies available and they were all five out and you have to change the movie. So you had to browse, you know, the whole shop to find another movie to watch. They also have a limited catalog. So you can't see every movie you want. You kind of have to choose the ones that are there. And it's kind of high effort for both you and for the ones that have to, you know, refill all the shelves and manage all this kind of physical goods movement around. Now, of course, you know that Netflix have been tackling this issue. And so they had this beautiful paper catalogs or, you know, web catalogs that you could choose a movie from and then order it. And then it would come to your home as a DVD. So this is a massive improvement because A, you have a massive catalog now, you can really choose every movie you want. Um, it's lower effort because it comes to you, but there is still a downside, which is it's somewhat delayed. It doesn't come to you instantly. Um, so we all know that Netflix have evolved into a kind of web online streaming platform. And so today what we can do is that, you know, we can see the movie we want across all the catalog in the world, um, instantly here and now as we want it from our couch. So it's a, it's a massive change in society in terms of service provision. It's a lot more comfortable. There is a lot less effort. And so we have been seeing this massive transition from something that was a very high effort and very limited and very expensive to something that is very easy to consume and where we want it, when we want it, and what we want as well. And this kind of where we want, what we want, when we want has been somewhat characterizing the latest generations that have grown up in this world where we can just decide what movie to watch in a second um, and then have it delivered to us immediately. The same concept of say Amazon Prime, next day delivery, what you want, where you want, when you want. And um, 
the issue is that this new generation has to deal with a payment infrastructure that is nowhere near these expectations. Um, so let's look at how, for example, a SaaS payment looks like. So we believe digital money is somewhat broken because we ported this outdated financial system to the digital internet native economy we're experiencing every day. Um, so let's look at how kind of a software payment looks like normally in the SaaS economy. You normally start signing up for a business um, in one moment, let's say now, and let's assume this person stops using that um, service in a year time. So there are two actions from the user here, the kind of sign up and kind of log out or, or sign off. So they don't want the payment anymore, right? So the system anymore. So it's one year and it's just two interactions, the start and, and the end. Um, however, if you look at how our payments world work today, especially with online credit card subscriptions, this requires 12 interactions between some of the service provider systems and the kind of consumer systems in this case. And all these interactions take time, effort, cost, and can fail. So across all this period of one year where you know, the user has been using the service, a lot of items can actually go wrong. So what happens here is that you know, maybe one of these payments is failing. And normally what would happen is that someone will chase you up, maybe tell you to update the credit card details so that the one maybe was expired and you have just to put a new one in. And so there is a cycle that starts that, you know, might just take some effort and cost from both sides, because on one side, they have to chase you up. And on the other side, you have to update the data. Um, but normally it's resolved, say. So, you know, you pay just a little bit delayed. The system doesn't stop. The service is available to you and everything is fine. With the issue that there was some cost in the, in, in the process that was additional to what would have, would have been needed if the system didn't break down and the payment didn't fail. However, in a big amount of these situations, over 10%, what happens is that the failure of the payment discourages the user to continue using the service. So this actually was a user that was willing to continue paying and suddenly uh, you know, is not a user anymore. And so you know, how big is this problem like in the SaaS industry alone? Uh, well, it looks like 11% um, of failed payments turn into churn. This is uh, according to a report by Forrester in November 2020. So it's, it's, a, it's a big value. And if you consider scaling this across a large organization like Netflix, I can imagine that it generates quite a lot of cost. So, um, you know, let's look a little bit deeper into what this kind of payment failure means for the user, for example. So, uh, you know, there is a decrease in customer sat satisfaction, clearly. Um, there is an increase in cost of recovery because they have to recover the funds. Sometimes the user maybe didn't pay, but then never pays, and this generates some debt. So, you know, failed payments can turn into bad debt that is really hard to collect because it's really hard for a company to chase you for, you know, $11.50 um, that you have to pay to them. But if you scale the amount of users that have to pay that amount and never do, it can create a bit of a revenue issue for the SaaS provider. So it is actually a, a big problem. So we believe that uh, services should, as, as services flow in real time from provider to client, payments should work in the same way. So we don't have, we, we don't have to have so many more interactions uh, from, you know, the, from both parties to make this agreement work. So uh, we believe in a better way. And so we're trying to dissect how that could look like for especially this kind of SaaS industry. So Let's think about what I was the example I was doing before, where someone signs up today and then stops using the service after one year with this kind of 12 payments, one per month in between. So what would be the kind of ultimate solution to this problem? Well, ideally, um, the minimal effort solution would be that there are two interactions here when I sign up and when I stop paying. And so it would be ideal to have this interaction when I start this is, I start subscribing to a service, I basically start potentially paying. And then when I stop, I stop paying. This is the most ideal situation because we are coupling the action of turning on and off the service provision with the payment. The issue is that if we do this with the traditional system, you would either have to pay everything upfront 
and that is unfair to the client most of the time, especially in a consumer market, or you have to pay everything at the end with a very high risk from the provider of the service. So this doesn't really work. And that's one of the reasons why we have subscriptions on a monthly basis, because they make it easier for both sides to at least uh, manage their revenues and cash flow. But there is a better way. So imagine if we could start signing up for a service and start the payment at the same time and then pay along the way and then stop paying at the end. So imagine just the ability of sending a small fraction of a dollar or of a penny every second or in real time from one side to the other as the service is provided to the client, the payment goes back to the supplier. So that is a very powerful idea. And um, you know it can really unlock a lot of uh, value in our economy because it removes all this friction with this 12 payments or even more if you're signing up for like say 10 years or five years or if it's rent going to, to your landlord. So we call this payment streaming. Is this idea that you can send value over time in a frictionless fashion on chain between parties. And I just want to kind of um, try to expand more on what does it look like when multiple parties are trying to start this kind of payment among each other? So um, just for those that don't know the kind of value provision of streaming or what they bring to the to kind of in terms of features, uh, let me just detail them for you in a, in a second. So why streaming? Why would you want to send money over time, a fraction of a penny per second? Well, first of all, you have this kind of constant flow. So both parties know the payment is ongoing and every second money is moving along the way. So it's fair for both because nobody has to pay up front or at the end, but you have an atomic swap between service provision and, and value payment. Also, you don't have to lock any capital because your capital is only used and then moves across to the other side in real time. So either you have it or the other person has it, which means both sides can put that capital at work while it's not moving. And that transaction is really instant. So it's really powerful for, for capital efficiency. Also, these streams are interconnected. So if you pay someone in a stream, that other person can forward that onto whatever the person wants to. So they can direct, say, 20% of the stream to some savings account, pay the rent, uh, pay some of their expenses, or bring it into DeFi. So you can create concatenated streams in an interconnected economy. Um, also, you can have open-ended streams that don't have an end date. So if you have an ongoing service, but you don't know when you're going to stop using it, you don't have to know in advance or set in advance an end date. So it can be an ongoing payment rather than a finite payment. And also there is no gas fees on the chain for as long as the stream is running. So you do pay gas to open a stream, edit it, or close it, but you would never need to pay gas for the status quo or keeping the flow running. And this is a very powerful uh, you know, uh, economic structure so that you can actually move any amount of money between two points without paying any fees for the ongoing flow of money. And all of this comes with a simple token wrapping. So you know, to add all these features to any ERC20 token, all you have to do is just wrap it with a superfluid wrapper. So that's why streaming is so powerful because it has the ability of leveraging all these features together. So what would this look like um, you know, among multiple parties? So as you can see here, I just tried to map uh, blocks um, as entities or consumers or businesses, and the green lines would look like streams, and so that's kind of the value flowing between them. So imagine how efficient it would be if a business could receive all the revenues in a stream and have them say immediately available on a per second basis and then use all of these revenues to then pay their suppliers and making sure that they you know they can pay in real time so this fantomatic business could have all of the revenues in a stream or a big chunk of them and then all of their expenses so imagine they are almost equal because they're growing aggressively but without basically borrowing any capital, then you could create a company or an organization which really works as, on a very thin buffer. They don't have to have a lot of capital in-house to absorb the shocks 
of you know uh, normal traditional cash flows. Of course, they will need some buffer to potentially manage streams changes. If someone stops paying, then the stream will stop. And so they need to absorb that and they can't just pay out directly, but is greatly reduced. And so it would be very efficient for an economy to run in this fashion. But it's not just about you know, business to business trade or service provision. It can also be for something like investing in real time or exchanging. So let's add in here an exchange. Now you're sending a currency and you are receiving the other currency in real time. What this allows you to do as a business is if you have revenues in say dollars or the dollar equivalent in crypto, that means that you can pay your suppliers in a different currency and get the real time market exchange rate at all time. So you don't have to bet on it. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. So now you can see how this can expand even further. So imagine a closed loop now where you know, someone is an employee in a company and gets paid in a stream, goes out there in the world and um, you know, pays a subscription to some service like Messari for informing himself about crypto. And then someone at Messari is an employee as well and, or, or a contributor and gets paid in a stream as well. So what you can do here is you can do some sort of closed loops where the money flows really across the different players and doesn't really sit anywhere but it is really just efficiently flowing across the economy. So if you were to expand this even further, um, you would have effectively an interconnected Web3 economy where value could throw frictionless with no delays across the different players and have um, an, an allocation to something that is valuable or meaningful at any time so that you can direct capital to what is meaningful for the economy or what is convenient for the economy. So is, is this kind of idea of having an interconnected network where financial players and economic player can interact one another without intermediaries really and with instant or real-time payments and the ability to um, have this flowing across them without any queues or delays that could create inefficiencies. So you, you might look at this picture and say, wow, this is very interesting, but you know, it's utopic or is far in the future. And uh, you know, we didn't see this yet. So what I'd like to share with you now is um, a 3D visualization of just uh, 300 wallets that are streaming stable coins on Polygon. And they are doing so in real time over Superfluid protocol. So what you're seeing here in this visualization is Polygon network um, on a stable coin. And you can see how there are micro economies like the one in the middle of the screen now, where there are different addresses in this case, interacting with streams to one another to power a micro economy. I tuned down the amount of uh, addresses in this visualization to show you exactly how microeconomies are working. So this could be a, easy a super app, which is doing some interesting financial transaction or just distributing tokens. This one, it's more like a reward DAO or a reward stream where someone is rewarding a lot of contributors, a small amount of, um, of, of stable coins um, over time. And then if we go here, we see like a circular economy where players are transacting to one another in what it could even be like an endless loop. So there is really a lot of opportunities um, that we could build with this kind of infrastructure. Now, let's expand to more than a thousand wallets and look at what the Polygon network looks like on a stable coin uh, as well. So this is over a thousand wallets. And now you start seeing how it looks like a brain structure. There is a lot of interconnections among different players. And you can see rather sophisticated connections like the one in the bottom center of the, space, of the screen now where we're gonna zoom in in a second, where they can really build this interconnected web three economy and value could flow in real time across all these players with no friction. So if we were to do this with 100% efficiency, which is of course impossible to achieve, um, we would reach about uh, infinite velocity of money streaming. So that there would be an infinite, infinite velocity of capital, uh, which would be very, very effective in uh, you know, reducing friction and reducing queues um, in, in our economy. So I just wanted to kind of leave it there uh, with this visualization of the Polygon network, because um, the, the possibilities are somewhat endless. And I believe this concept of um, 
a frictionless interconnected economy um, has all the potential um, to you know, transform society fundamentally because you can generate economic growth without having to inflate the pie, but just reducing inefficiency in the existing GDP that a country, for example, is generating. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them now, or you can find me on Twitter at Michele Daliesi or on Discord of Fluted Finance. And we would love to talk about what you can build with these tools, like what applications we can generate. And uh, you know, if anyone has any idea, we would love to hear from them. That was uh, amazing. I think uh, the question I and everybody has on the chat is, that is an incredible visualization. Who made this thing? What did you use? And how can we make it for other things? <laughs> Yeah, so um, the visualization um, is actually done by someone in the network of Francesco. So I think he would be a better place to answer that. And he's uh, he has been hacking it away just for this presentation. So we could, uh, yesterday night, he was just doing it so that we could have it uh, for today. But um, it's just a start, you know, we can do a lot more. And, you know, we can color addresses based on what they do. So if they're a DAO or if they are you know, an exchange, uh, or an end of user wallet. Um, so, you know, we are just uh, getting started. That's, a, that's amazing. And, and and it's like overall, just I think um, a really good way to kind of think about structuring how we think payments would work. And you, you are kind of, I think this kind of came up in our panel earlier too, which is the second you kind of have anywhere from multi-chain world to multiple apps talking to each other and just overall composability, then most things turn into a routing problem. And that's where most of the efficiency comes in. And being able to say, hey, we can make this process or cut this step is an actual uh, massive improvement. And uh, you just kind of get that as a default here, which is which is great. Uh, my uh, kind of only other question would be, uh, actually, let's see. I feel like there's a, a comment coming from, oh, no, it's just Fran replying to uh, who made that <laughs> visualization on the chat. <laughs> this is great. Uh, well, I think the questions I want to ask will probably overlap with uh, the next panel. So I'm, I'm just going to pause here and uh, and we'll just kind of go into the next one early because I was going to curious about more real-time application examples, but that's exactly what the next panel is about. So I want to thank you for uh, doing this chat uh, and uh, the presentation. And uh, I'd love to kind of bring on the next set of panelists. Thank you, Kartik. It was a pleasure. Right. So as we uh, bring on everybody here on the panel, I'd like to welcome uh, three amazing people. So Luca from Maker, Nikhil from Circle, and Frank from Superfluid. And we're going to talk about just how we think on-chain payments is going to evolve. Uh, Maker, Circle, and Superfluid are kind of the common pieces here that everybody's using for just interacting on the chain, uh, especially as we think about stable coins being the fundamental base layer of sending money here and, and all what DeFi has done. So I couldn't be more excited to bring everybody on. So at this point, I'd like to ask everybody to turn on their cameras and, and kind of introduce themselves and say hi, and uh, we can get this started. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, we uh, we already know who Fran is, um, but I'd love to invite uh, Luca and Nikhil to uh, introduce themselves and talk about uh, what you do and uh, just give an overview of the product uh, for those of us on the chat that may not be aware. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, Luca here. Um, so I I work with Maker. I'm one of the core team members of Maker. Pretty much looking at anything that has to do with the financial risk oversight of the protocol. I, I'm an independent researcher. I write my own research and publish it under a substack called Dirt Roads that I hope that some of you have heard of. And invest in the space and have great, great chats with super smart people like Fra. So thanks for having me. Excited to have you, Nikhil. Yeah, thanks for having me, Karthik. Um, my name is Nikhil Chanduk. I am Chief Product Officer at Circle. Um, what Circle does is uh, it makes a, a, makes a stable coin, it sort of ships a stable coin, uh, which I think everybody knows about, it's USDC. Um, uh, we have products in the payment space uh, that we have in market and that we are building further out. Uh, we're excited about payments. We're excited about lending. So we can talk about uh, anything today. So uh, thanks for having me. We're excited to have you as well. Um, so maybe I'll kind of just jump right in. Uh, the most kind of obvious question is, um, 
you've kind of seen this ecosystem evolve from multiple angles here. What's kind of been the most like interesting trend about specifically payments that uh, each of you have seen? Uh, we, we can start with Fran here and uh, have you kind of just showcase what has surprised you in the last year? Well, I mean, working at Superfluid, obviously, I think the most interesting part of payments is uh, streaming, right? Uh, more in general, recurring payments. Uh, the reason specifically I'm excited about recurring payments is that it can actually bring income on chain, right? And that's very interesting if you look at, for example, Erbil's uh, presentation from uh, earlier, right? Because bringing income on chain is what will onboard so many users, right? Uh, one of the examples he brought was Gamify, right? So like play to earn games. And these are onboarding literally millions of users and they're not coming to speculate, they're coming to earn money, right? So the earning uh, potential that uh, recurring payments or streaming brings and the, the fact that those earnings are on chain and can be used for other stuff, I think is very interesting. I think we're still just scratching the surface here. Uh, I think Kuma Finance is gonna be a very important uh, protocol in the future regarding uh, lending against these uh, earnings. In terms of other payments infrastructure, I've seen a lot built on Superfluid I'm very excited about. We've seen uh, Diagonal Finance, but also another startup called uh, Drip, which are building checkouts with, uh, let's say, specific mechanics built into the payment layer itself, right? And that's something that you can uniquely do uh, on-chain, while well, you can't really do off-chain, right? So if a payment happens, then, you know, trigger something. Uh, you can deliver a loyalty NFT, you can deliver a social token, you can, you know, uh, redirect a, a recurring, um, uh, for example, referring referral revenue, right? All of these things you can encode directly into the payment stream because it's happening on-chain. So this is kind of the, the most important and uh, interesting thing for me. Amazing. Uh... Luca, any anything to add here? I mean, I I, I started uh, chatting about what the guys at Superfluid were were doing uh, almost a year ago because I think again, streaming payments can be abstracted into into streaming value uh, that can have so many so many um, applications. And I I always thought that the the way DeFi or crypto in general steps up to the next level is by onboarding as many use cases as possible from the real world. So I think uh, allowing value to flow uh, seamlessly through people to people in payments, but also in supply chains, I think is what fascinates me the most. I, I had a couple of chats with companies that are trying to innovate in the supply, supply chain system by creating a uh, a seamless flow of value that goes along the chain. And I think it's, uh, it, it, which is an incredible source of inefficiency these days financially with a lot of value trapped. So I'm very excited to see the evolutions in that front as well. That's awesome. Um, I think you've already kind of all touched upon topics that I want to dig into in general. And uh, and by the way, for we're already kind of getting some comments from the audience. If you have any questions for our speakers, please just put them in the chat and uh, I'll be able to ask them here. But uh, it, to me, this is an interesting point because I think both Maker and Circle are kind of at the intersection of onboarding existing businesses that are in Web2 to more Web3, but also then enabling a whole new set of Web3 uh, native uh, companies and, and uh, types of businesses to exist. Um, kind of from how you've seen USDC or, or DAI being used, um, has there been something that's kind of surprised you uh, in terms of like, oh, I didn't think this could be possible? Or of course, streaming is a perfect example, but I'm curious, like what has been an unintended consequence of a good example of how your stable coins have been utilized by people? Maybe- uh... I, can, I can take the <laughs> crack, I feel like. Uh, the uh, uh, So, I'll say two things. One is uh, we have the Circle has this partnership with Stripe where they're doing payouts on Twitter. Um, and uh, so the use cases, uh, Twitter have creators that they want to pay. These creators are all over the world. Um, they they want to make sure that, you know, I, they can essentially share earnings with them. What's an, what's an easy infrastructure to build to be able to do that? Well, clearly using on-chain payouts is the best way to do it. Doing it in a stable coin is like uh, is definitely preferable. So Twitter, like Stripe, Stripe and Twitter are experimenting with USDC uh, for these payouts. 
why this is interesting, um, I worked at YouTube for seven, eight years. I was there really early. And YouTube is one of the earliest companies that did creator payouts. And uh, so for those who don't know, if you upload a video on YouTube, you get to keep, and you monetize it, you get to keep 55%. Building that infrastructure that connects, like connects the ad impression, the ad payout to the creator payout is extremely complex. And then scaling it to the whole world is where YouTube is at, I think today at like two and a half billion users is incredibly complex. Uh, so um, I think to do that so simply, is like fascinating to me uh, because that was one of the ways we built a moat around YouTube because nobody else could do it. Facebook didn't do it. For, um, I think they're just doing it now. And so <clears throat> I think the power of that is pretty phenomenal. I kind of love the idea of streaming payments there. Uh, I haven't wrapped my head around like, you know, ad verification to streaming payout, uh, like a payout to a creator. Uh, I think there's some nice use cases to explore there as well. Uh, so that's sort of one bucket, I'd say. The other bucket that is really interesting to me, again, is um, I think there are two large ecosystems about to collide, which is really interesting. Uh, one is uh, payments, which is, uh, you know, how can we make it more efficient? We can, have un we can make things more efficient and we can unlock more use cases because we do things on chain. So that's super interesting, um, whether it's streaming, whether it's payouts, like, you know, there's all manners of things we can do. Um, <clears throat> the other is like, uh, is the ads ecosystem. And we don't talk about ads much in crypto because I think nobody likes ads, but ads basically built the internet. And yes, along the way, there were some trade-offs that were made that are not, <laughs> that are not pleasant and not good. Um, and, but I think the fundamental business need is to acquire users and, and, and have a way to acquire users and businesses will pay money to acquire users. What I see happening now with like novel payment formats, uh, with NFTs, with these new novel platforms coming together, it's sort of a collapse of like the payments ecosystem with the ads ecosystem. And I think like that is super interesting, which is like, if there is a wallet that pays me and if I can have a close relationship with the user because they paid me on chain and then I issue something to them on chain and then I have a loyalty program. And if that becomes super portable and allows for new networks to emerge, Ads market is a trillion dollar market. Payment is payments itself is trillion dollar market. So the need for like cheaper payments and the need for acquiring customers is not going to go away. And if you collapse those two things together, we are in this new world of like payments and ads working together, um, which I, which I just find intellectually very fascinating. Um, and I think we're just seeing sprouts of that now. So. Well, that is a really good framing. Um, uh, I do want to kind of comment and dig into that, but uh, I don't want to deprive Luca of any comments that he wanted to share. So I'll go for it. Yeah. I Sometimes I get a bit abstract, so I apologize in advance. Uh, it's the mathematician in me. I, I think uh, I think all of us that I have are seeing a different angle of uh, the stable coin and the payment system in DeFi, which is fascinating. I think the USDC, USDC guys at Circle, they have... Uh, an incredible um, perspective on the on ramping of ramping of liquidity and the true use of USDC as a mean of, means of payment, which is fascinating. At Dai, uh, we is slightly different. I think at uh, at Maker, we are we are starting to see the use of Dai as a as a as a great stabilizer of DeFi. That you will never imagine because Dai ultimate is like is very cent is a central liquidity source of DeFi very trustable. And now after the last two weeks, we are starting to see the value of this trust. Uh, I always thought the over collateraliz the, 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 the problem that over collateralization is not a scalable system in, in stable coins is a meme, it's not true. But and I'm, I will not, I will get into that rabbit hole. But I think we are starting to see DAI being used as a stabilizer of many use cases in DeFi, from interest rates to credit, credit uh, interest rates, and uh, liquidity risk here, here and there. And I think this is something that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, it was not imaginable a couple of years ago, right? I think crypto instability were two things that were not going together. Uh, but I, I think it's, um, it's something that we will see more and more and more over the years. Absolutely. And I remember uh, just two years ago, we were celebrating uh, DeFi TVL hitting a billion dollars. And then now we're over a hundred and nobody even thinks about like, that exponential leap and uh, the, the pace that everything is evolving is just truly mind blowing. 
Um, Fran, I want to also kind of give you a chance. Uh, of course, streaming is a super interesting, massive category of its own. What's kind of been um, something that you've kind of seen uniquely enabled uh, on the streaming money side? Well, actually, without uh, mentioning streaming money, I think what uh, Stripe did was super interesting, as Nikhil mentioned. I mean, that was just uh, incredible, right? And, uh, it really shows you how crypto can break barriers significantly, right? Where a traditional fintech would have to go and have specific partners in each country they want to make a payout in. And that's, you know, effectively, you know, means only Google can do it. With crypto, you can send money anywhere, right? And that's something we're seeing a lot uh, also in Superfluid. You know, if you look at uh, some of the teams that are using Superfluid to pay compensation, right? They pay people all over the world. Uh, in a lot of cases, they don't even know where their team is, right? Uh, and they can just pay that because an address is just a, a unique identifier that that is all you need to make a payment, right? Contrast that with a bank where you know you get asked uh, the reason for the payment, you get asked uh, you know the address of the payment. I recently got asked the birthday of the uh, payee, right? So it's just a completely different world. Um, and if you think of the fact that you can establish long-term financial relationships just by clicking a button and making one transaction on the blockchain. I think it's it's clear that there's a lot of opportunities there, and as Nikhil said, it's it's a massive market. So you know, bringing payments on chain and bringing uh, onboarding that next billion users will be through payments. I, I have no doubts because not everybody needs to trade uh, dog money, right? But everybody needs to make payments. And that's absolutely right. And this is exactly what I was going to comment on uh, from Nikhil's question, which is yeah, fundamentally the the reason why some of these massive um, kind of companies sort of got the network set up is because yeah, you have to take on anywhere from the legal cost to understanding the, the generalization of this payout network. And it's different for every jurisdiction, different for every country, different for even different amounts, triggering various edge cases. And you now just get to eliminate that by having an address that just exists. And you can figure out multiple ways to now use that or disperse that in, in different places. And I think like that's to me an interesting good example of a middleman where you've just made that the abstraction and it, it can flow anywhere from there. And now you have explorations possible on both sides. So I can need to figure out which fiat railway to connect to, to disperse it in different places. And that's where Stripe's kind of going on. On the other side, now I have the money. I can stream it in different places, but it's on the top there. That's where Superfluid is going. And you fundamentally have, uh, yeah, programmatically sort of enable a whole new world that just wasn't possible before. Um, when we kind of think about that, essentially, of course, I agree. Money is uh, a massive market. <laughs> Everybody needs that for for everything in in any capitalistic world. But uh, is is kind of the thinking here that we fundamentally just get the same experiences that we already know uh, and use in our daily lives? They're just now more transparent or or faster. Or do you kind of believe that it changes how we also interact? I mean, Nikhil, you touched on like the ad part of things and customer acquisitions becomes a lot more easier, but. Uh, like, how do we think about room for improvement on now bunny being on chain? It's, it's an open question. We can uh, look at anybody of you <laughs> first, Luca. Yeah, I, I I can say that if uh, it's, oh, right. it's fine for the the other panelists. I I I always joke that I think money is the most sophisticated, most mass massly mass market product in the world. It's like the most complex philosophical product. We all use it. We completely ignore how it works and we're all happy, <laughs> which is incredible. Uh, because I mean, but I think the point is money does many things, right? We always, we always have the, the canonical definition that money is a currency in general, is a unit of account, is a storage of value, is a, is a means of exchange. But I think there is another uh, uh, there is another point that I think is the most important is an allocator of resources. You, we work more where we get more money, and it's four very complex uh, functionalities that are wrapped into one. That is the banknote we have in our pockets, or the money we think we have in our accounts. That is actually very different from the banknotes, but people ignore it. Uh, but I think so. We we are we we go used to, to the idea that. The, net, the money of the future should be the same, should be like a, uh, this omnicomprehensive product. I don't think it's going to be the case. I think we will see different types of currency or subsets of currency doing different things. And then my, you might have a, the, a great stable coin. I hate the term, but it's, let's keep stable coin. I, the great stable coin for transact, 
a great stable coin to access leverage, a great stable coin to store value, great stable coin to allocate incentives. And, and this is what the token economy is enabling. And I think we will start seeing this type of specialization you dig in, uh, in the future. Uh, what, are, what are some of the properties of like these three examples? Like what will be different for, for a coin there and, and why does that classification exist? I mean, I, I'll, I'll give an example that an infamous example of what happened in the last uh, few months. So Terra was minting UST. People were not using UST as a mean of exchange. They were not using UST as a storage value. They were using UST as an access for leverage. That was the only thing. It was not a stable coin. It was a, it was a money market product within a, within a coin. And you know, I, I don't want to go into the details, but it was a, it was a source of, of leverage. Uh, people are using DAI to store value on chain because they think they believe in this principle of decentralization and over collateralization. And the, the crypto natives, they love using DAI as, as that, that storage of value. But DAI itself uses USDC because USDC is a great stabilizer because it represents, mimics the power and the trust of the US economy into crypto. And we are the largest holder of USDC in the world, at least at, until a couple of days, couple of uh, couple of weeks ago. Uh, so there, it's and, and the relationship is synergic. USDC is also used for transacting off ramping and, and on ramping, and and maybe other tokens that can be can flow uh, through the superfluid protocol, for example, that are not coins, would be incredible um, tools to incentivize people better than currency. So I think we started to see. That, things being, they differentiate themselves. And it's difficult for us because we have always considered money as one single monolithic construct, but it, it is not. Even in the real world, and I, I, I stop rumbling, mumbling, but in, even in, in, the, in the real world, people are using the dollar in a different way compared to how they use their local currency in emerging markets. That is a payment tool. The dollar is, is an international payment tool or a storage of value. And I think, it's, it's become, it will become more and more and more specialized. Now, what would be the ultimate experience of the end user? I don't know. Uh, probably would be seamless. But in the background, many, many interesting things will happen, I think. I think that's a really interesting abstraction to dig into. I, I think, Fran, you wanted to say something, so I'll let you and, and Nikhil kind of comment on the original question. We can dig into this, this after. <laughs> Wanted to comment on Lucas, uh, on what Lucas saying. That's something I've I've uh, been thinking about a lot, and I think with things like Superfluid, where you can actually really accelerate the movement of money and automate it, we will start seeing people having basically no dollars in their bank account, right? But that's not because they're not transacting in dollars. They are transacting in dollars. They're simply transacting really quickly, but they're not holding any dollars. They're holding maybe Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? So they're using dollars as a medium of exchange, but not necessarily as a store of value or stability or anything else, right? So these kinds of things become possible as you build financial automations and financial tools that enable money to move faster and exchange forms faster, right? Uh, if it becomes easier to, for example, imagine if as a user, you can uh, put your Bitcoin or Ethereum as collateral and then borrow in a stream to pay your rent, right? At that point, uh, maybe you're, the person you're paying a rent to is then reinvesting it into Bitcoin, right? So I'm paying the rent in, uh, in dollars. I'm taking the leverage in dollars, but I actually never hold dollars. And the counterparty never holds dollars either. So we're using dollars purely as a unit of account for the rental contract and as a medium of exchange, but neither of us actually have dollars, right? So it's a pretty fascinating idea if you start thinking about it. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I was going to say, we we're kind of coming up with the, the photons of the money world's analogy in this case. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea, by the way. I think like the, uh, I mean, money is many things to Lucas' point, like, you know, cash is highly inefficient, sits in my pocket and doesn't do anything. And so cash, money, dollars in my bank account sits in, sits in the account and doesn't do anything. Well, it does do something. It allows the bank to lend forward. But I think like one of the things that Fran is pointing out that like it can do more things for me. Um, like if I have $200 in the bank, I can have it be in Bitcoin. I can, you know, real time essentially stream my rent. I find that idea really fascinating. Like, because I came to work on this primarily because I think the 
risk capital in the world is like uh, misallocated and like how can we get it to be allocated better because it's sort of that's what people who are poor need is they need risk capital they don't need a gift of money right like and they need like a stable form of capital and they need they need to be able to take risk which is in america it's it's phenomenal like the way you can do that and crypto does that on chain now you can take on risk um you you can chain on take on risk you know there's not as much risk capital it's all over collateralized but i think like the dream is where it's under collateralized and like you can have like the money if i have like a thousand dollars sitting in my usdc account it's actually true for me today i have money any cash i have i put into maple finance now it's it's not quite streaming there is a lock in um uh, but it's just money that i parked there because it's being used to like fund these businesses on the other side and there's a very specific type of business there today but the reason i fund it is because i believe more real world businesses are going to come in through these pools uh that maple are exposing and it's highly efficient for me to be able to deploy that money it takes me like 2 minutes like going to my metamask to do, do a couple of clicks and the money is deployed i think that kind of efficiency is really really powerful uh in terms of like creating opportunity for people right like that's what that's what gets me jazz which is uh i mean all the other defi constructs are fascinating but like if we can connect the real world to this then we should be able to inc- like none of us should have like dead cash uh we should all, and we should that doesn't mean that we don't get access to liquidity today we hold cash because we need access to liquidity i think we could deploy our cash and still have access to liquidity it would be like the magical place to be and then we can have like fun more things in the world because we would just be fundamentally more efficient so uh, but yeah friend I, i'd love i actually was just reading a paper uh before starting i find it fascinating yeah and i th- i think i can jump in here because i think it's 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 relevant to what nikhil just said to describe how we can compose this monetary stack so dai we have an infinite balance sheet we can print as many much dai as we want as long as there is trust in the dai so we need good collateral to print dai against and we started with this idea of onboarding real world use cases a year ago in a bootstrap way saying okay let's go to the borrowers directly but it would be like the fed trying to underwrite a mortgage of an individual of a corporate so it's very inefficient it's a test so we are starting to do protocol to protocol liquidity and the example of maple is is a relevant example because maple has been currently approved by the maker community to develop a direct deposit module where there will be a dai pool potentially where uh, maker will be the stabilizer of that pool maker will print money and deposit it as a senior tranche of that pool that then loans the money out together with other other money uh through pool delegates that take first first loss risk into the real economy and in this way we are we are letting dai flow in the hands of as many people as possible but in a very sustainable way and composable way where we have a competitive advantage infinite balance sheet at quasi zero cost of capital other pools have other competitive advantages they are great in creating products they have great access to the ultimate borrowers they have a great user experience or structure whatever so we give them our advantage advantage access to a super cheap and infinite source of capital as long as they do their job well and they do the rest of the heavy lifting and take most of the profits in this way we can help other borrowers to other lenders to take the right type of risk they want and not being uh, exposed to a bank run and borrowers to access risk capital because i i agree this is this is the real what what we want we want to give risk cap, good risk capital to the right borrowers <laughs> and maple is doing it to our frequency traders tomorrow will do it to somebody else goldfinch is doing it in 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 the emerging markets credits wants to do it in emerging markets truefi is doing it to corporates so there is a great there is a there is a lot of innovation there absolutely i think uh no that's a that's a really good way to think about kind of just framing that and i was going to say like for for both of you uh luca and uh, nikhil like how uh, I feel like I think USDC especially is in more of a position where you get to see more traditional businesses coming in and and on ramping um kind of from your perspective like what's holding up um uh, more volumes to kind of go up or or more anywhere from merchant adoption to just a high kind of volume case like what are some common themes or roadblocks that you see or questions that get asked Yeah I mean I think from a it's we can look at it both from a lending perspective and a borrowing perspective I think from a lending perspective um 
people are still skeptical of crypto yields. They don't fully understand it. Like I think, was it last week that US Terra died? Like, uh, yeah, so uh, that is not good for us, right? Like as an industry, people just equate USDC die, uh, USDT uh, with Terra, and they have the same questions. And even our largest, largest lenders called us that day. And they said, well, how does this affect you? Uh, even though we are very clear that we are Bitcoin, uh, large, like, you know, when you put money into circle yield, it's over collateralized with Bitcoin and it's, there's, there's no connection to US Terra, um, but still makes people nervous. And I think it's just early days in terms of people getting comfortable with uh, yield that crypto markets can create. Um, also our yields are not the best right now because like, you know, there's just, Fed is giving out amazing yield. And, and so and I think that is not lost on people. So they're like, well, I can take on the risk of crypto, but for what? So I think that'll, that'll eventually settle. Uh, one argument can be, well, those yields are gonna converge uh, eventually because like who cares whether it's crypto or, uh, or not? Well, I, I, I still think there's some, some time before that happens. The on on the under collateralized lending side, I'd say on the on the borrowing side, so to speak, um, I'd say we're just like Maple's just a year old. Even Goldfinch, I think, is less than a year old. Like being in market, I'm sure those projects are longer, but like them being live, it's so early. Look at the experience of like lending into a pool on Maple today. Like you can go and evaluate, like you know the pool you can see their history you can see who they're lending out to but really don't know because you really haven't digested the data there's no rating service on the debt that they have uh, there's nobody who is tracking like the performance of the underwriter over a long enough period of time and arguably there hasn't been a long enough period of time and so the at least my my vision is that like eventually we move into a world in which there are hundreds and thousands of like underwriters on the internet and they are in these like very specific pools that are specific to industry um, and like you know if you're in climate you want to represent carbon credits uh, on on chain and you want to make sure there's a unique representation of a carbon credit so it's not sold twice it's like a common problem that I have found in my discussions. Um, if you are, I talked to somebody who was doing a protocol and they were just buying invoices and they had a specific protocol where they would buy the invoices um, and make 10% on like a net 90 invoice and they have specific needs and that's gonna get encoded in a protocol. And then eventually they will have specific underwriters within that protocol, uh, um, you know, who are, who are essentially managing that debt. So I think this whole ecosystem will evolve really fast we need is i think systems that can allocate across these different pools systems that can evaluate the different pools uh, more rep, more primitives to represent these assets on chain because those primitives are very basic right now um and yeah. then of uh, what could be like what's the list of new primitives or variations that we we need to see i know you already touched. i think they're industry specific like that's what i said like you know how do you represent a carbon credit like uh there are these voluntary carbon markets like um and now verification is easier for some class of use cases because you have satellite imagery okay great so i know that the trees that you said are going to be there are there but now if i <laughs> there's no way of knowing did you sell that carbon credit three times uh, well if everything goes on chain you can be sure that it wasn't sold three times right like so um i think it is going to be by industry so i don't think maybe there's one protocol that rules them all and it's possible um but i think there will be some sort of like you know if you look at the web and then there was search and um i don't know what the equivalent of search is but i think we will go looking for yield across these vast pools as as an economy and we're gonna have to figure out like you know what are the systems we need to sort of alloc allocate capital across these different yield pools and like people will have a bazillion preferences and and then all of this how does this intersect the real world in terms of security laws uh, do you only want this to be a DeFi system not really if you want to attract all the money then you have to intersect the world of securities laws at some point how will that work i think so those questions come from businesses as well going back to your original question like you know well, if I buy this, am I buying a security? <laughs> and 
what happens if I connect my wallet to it? Uh, if what if the wallet is hosted? There's all kinds of uh, regulatory things that we're still reasoning through. But I'm very optimistic that if we can show the benefit, then the demand will come, the supply will come. You can call it, you can call either side the demand or the supply, um, because the need is there. Like the if you are starting a business today, if you want to do something new in the world, you need capital. And that need is gonna not is, is not going away anytime soon. And nobody will say that it is a very efficient market. And so I think for, internet, internet for access, right? Yeah, the internet will do for like uh, for allocating this risk capital, what like you know, the internet did for like information. It made it super cheap. So how will that happen? I don't know. It's only, <laughs> it's only been like nine months or a year of this ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. I, I am very excited about it though. So like, I think it goes past payments. I think payments is really one. I'll give it to, uh, I'll give it back. Uh, payments is really interesting because it creates that on-chain data that can be used for verification. Like, um, you know, is this supplier, somebody who pays on time? How much have they paid? Who have they paid? Can you analyze the network of payees? What can you learn about it? Can you then like grade the supplier higher or lower based on that? It's just, it's, it's like navigating a network and like learning and making, building an index and like learning about it. And then, but yeah, done very differently because you're allocating money. Money has value. Getting information wrong has also has cost, but the cost is not immediate. It is diffused. So you've essentially made the case for uh, Lucas argument for specialization needed to yeah 100 percent. i i just don't know if like i believe that there is a stable coin for ecosystem or if there's just different ecosystems that all have like different rules and they're all normalized using a dollar denominated stable coin or if you look at fran's argument which is like so in each of these ecosystems you hold maybe the native coin and then you use the dollar just to settle and you're in and out of the dollar really fast that may be just fine like i <laughs> like, I, I don't know which way to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Luca, friend, uh, anything you want to add to this? No, I mean, I, I agree. I think I, it's, it's great to be, to remain open-minded. And I think uh, I have no clue as well how this will develop. And I think a good researcher reacts to new information with new hypotheses. So it, it, it is something that we keep, we keep evolving, but what is exciting of this industry for people like ourselves is we are not like journalists that are trying to predict the future. We are working to make that future real. So we also have, a, have an influence on how these things would develop. And I think I, I myself, I came into this industry after 15 years in traditional finance, and I see incredible amount of talent coming into this industry and they don't really care about prices. So I think even the bear market is going to be extremely productive. And I, I think more talent will come in, the more ideas and will be developed. So it's something that we can we can shape together, and we don't need necessarily to to mimic exactly what was before DeFi. I also think, for example, that I, I, this is a dream because I think it, it will mean that we will have had a successful transition on on-chain economy. I think at some point we will abandon the peg, like like uh, like a an emerging market that doesn't need to be packed to the dollar for credibility, but now is, is big enough to, to walk on, his, uh, on its own uh, legs. I think, I mean, at some point maybe is the value of if they will represent the value of that economy and it will be the base of the monitor for the monetary stock of a cert certain ecosystem. And, they will, and it's, it, it seems impossible now, but maybe, maybe, Maybe not, not in the future, also considering the inflation data and the uncertainty on the value of the monetary stock we are, we are seeing. But uh, institutions, like, institutions like Circle, for example, are so important because they are bridging the old world into the new rails. And although I have no doubts that we will migrate completely in a blockchain-enabled uh, financial system, I don't know when this is going to happen. And I think if we screw things up, we might delay this adoption by 20 years, which in our, in our perspective, it seems like it, it's like the same as it would never happen. So I think having uh, incredibly professional and dedicated innovative bridges between the, the off-chain and the on-chain economy is the most important thing we, we, we need, we have. And I, I, I truly hope that 
the dialogue with the regulators will be constructive because um, because it's so important for the regulators to participate in this migration, orderly migration. Otherwise, it will happen anyway, but it will happen it will happen in a messy way, and uh, the weak ones will be the ones to suffer, and we don't want this to happen. So it is it is very exciting, but I'm also like for me, my call to action is we are not here looking at the future and trying to predict how is it going to be and bet in the capital markets based on our prediction. We are here because we want to shape it. So everyone has a responsibility in the quality of the tweets, in the quality of the research, in the quality of work uh, to, to not just to speculate, but to create uh, the future we want. And I'm not, I'm not an idealist here. I think it's, it's real. And we all have this kind of personal responsibility, how we interact with the ecosystem or outside of the ecosystem. No, I think that's a really well put argument. I wish that was my last question because it would have been a perfect note to, to end on. Um, oh, I do have one more question, but I want to give Fran a chance to uh, to comment as well, and uh, we can get to wrapping up the, the panel. Yeah, honestly, there's not much I, I can add. Those were two great interventions. Um, the only thing I might comment to is something uh, Nikhil said about how yields are leaving because they're, the Fed is hiking up their own interest rates. So I, and that's something that uh, we've seen a few times, right? When, uh, when we started Superfluid, the yields in DeFi were at zero. I don't know how many people remember that. Um, even uh, MakerDAO, I think, had negative, uh, negative interest rate at some point. So what, um, what that tells us, the fact that they're inversely cor correlated, tells us that uh, the interest that we see in DeFi is purely driven by speculation because there's no actual economic activity. If there were uh, uncollateralized borrowing and lending, then we would have yields, even if yields in, uh, in the traditional markets are high. But we don't because there is nothing except for speculation at the moment. And I think it's very important to bring those payments on chain to create those markets for un uncollateralized lending because that will stabilize yields. If people are borrowing on chain, then there's yields, right? Regardless of what the off-chain yields are, right? And that will break that inverse specu inverse uh, relationship between the, the yields in DeFi and the uh, treasuries, which will also mean that you know, crypto in general becomes a real mature market, right? So ultimately breaking the direct connection between speculation and crypto is the only way we have to make this mature. And I think uh, payments are ultimately the harbinger of that, right? Because everybody needs to make payments. It's the simplest uh, way to bring people on board. And it will bring with it things like credit. It will bring with it things like uh, more efficient supply chains, potentially uh, cheaper everything, right? Because we have more efficient uh, rails for moving value. So overall, yeah, uh, as, as Luca said, feel a responsibility to make that future happen and uh, work in that direction. I absolutely agree. So, so maybe one uh, optimistic note to end on will be uh, just maybe getting a, a preview of how each of you are kind of enabling that. We'd love to learn about what you think is important for Maker to do and for Circle to do and for Superfleet to do to actually get millions more people coming in and, and be onboarded. I start with Maker very quickly. I, I, I spent an immense amount of energy over the last few months trying to protect the con this concept of prudence because we have a responsibility managing a stable coin and unfortunately these days it is quite evident that i was right uh, it doesn't feel good to to be right uh, and i want to keep evolving balancing this the need for prudence because i think it is very very important so what we are trying to do at maker is through protocol to protocol interactions we want to onboard as much high quality collateral as possible on chain. Showing to the world that there is a super efficient source of capital out there that can be used to distribute, to Nikit's point, uh, risk capital around the world. So showing that the, the, this value also for protocols that can build on this portable liquidity from Maker. And if we are successful, pro, the, the, the ecosystem will thrive capital will go into the right ends, not to the ones that want to speculate or originate a runaway. Maker will expand and uh, the die will be in more hands. And obviously uh, we will be even more important in the DeFi ecosystem. While staying, you know, being composable with others. And I want to stress, for example, 
there is space because everybody has a different specialization. So we have a very strong and deep strategic relationship with USDC, and it's a pillar of our of our construct. And uh, we think this will be will remain and will expand as we grow and mature. So I think this is what we're trying to do over the next uh, over the next few months. I, I can go. Um, I, I think like for for us, um, uh, we have like three broad focus areas. One is uh, we want to increase like the programmability of USDC. So fundamentally, we think about USDC as a platform. Uh, we think about um, the platform attributes being uh, liquidity, trust, and speed, and that's what we push on all day. Um, like that's what frames our entire product effort. Uh, how can we be more liquid? How can we, if you want to do something with USDC, how can you do it fast? Uh, and and then how we how do we maintain trust uh, at all times? So uh, so we're, we're going to keep pushing on that, and like that just means supporting more chains. We have more functionality coming. Uh, and as my, as we do that, like we are sort of uh, guiding light is where the developers are. Uh, so we go where the developers tell us to go. And there are good ways of analyzing that data. And like we just, we consume the data and we follow the developers. It's very simple. Um, so that's on the stable coin side. On the, and then like broadly speaking, we have two applications that we care about deeply. Uh, one is payments. Uh, uh, payments is, uh, we're going to do more like, in terms of increasing uh, increasing value in like crypto payments, uh, I think, um, and supporting like various methods of payments for the merchants that we are working with. Like merchants come to us today for PR payment rails. Uh, we're going to give them uh, a way to manage uh, uh, crypto rails as well uh, in the future. So that's one aspect. And then there's like all these accessory businesses around that. And the third thing for us is uh, is trying to figure out how to bring real world assets uh, on chain and how to enable those markets. What is our role there? Uh, we're still reasoning through it uh, because a lot of this is very exciting, uh, but still very early. So uh, I do agree with Fran's point that uh, payments is ready today. Like, you know, everybody needs to do it. It's a great way to onboard people. Um, and the last thing I'd say is like, um, there's a lot of one thing I am careful about as I reason about this is I approach everything with a lot of curiosity and not a lot of judgment because I don't know. Um, like, you know, there's a funky new liquidity scheme that like is, is really, really important to the ecosystem. I'm going to read the white paper. I'm going to try to make sense of it. And sometimes it doesn't make sense, like, you know, and it's just mind boggling to us, like as to why something should exist, but it does. Um, but our job at Circle is to keep making widgets. Like that's what we do. Um, and, and we make widgets for developers and we make widgets for businesses. And like, I am pretty confident that we have plenty of widgets to make over the next two years. I'm not bothered by the bear market. I'm not bothered by like, you know, like all the noise with regulation, like, because fundamentally I believe like what we're doing is useful. We are reducing costs, we're increasing opportunity. And as long as we can make that argument in good faith and with, uh, to very high scrutiny, I feel good about like uh, what we're doing. So that's yeah. Not, yeah. The best thing about that is uh, it's measurable and uh, defensible on chain. We can see it. Measurable and defensible on chain. So yeah, you don't have to believe me. You can just, <laughs> you just need to write it <laughs> You need to write something that can aggregate the data. That's it. And it's clearly working. So uh, I totally agree. Fran, last words to you. Well, I mean, similarly to uh, what Nikhil and, uh, and Luca said, ultimately, we have to keep building. doesn't matter, right? Uh, whatever happens in the market doesn't matter. We started the market when yields were negative. <laughs> that didn't matter. Uh, the yields might become negative again. It still doesn't matter, right? What we're doing is useful. Uh, it's uh, bringing efficiency, increasing opportunity. In our case, I, I also feel we're, you know, fundamentally bringing something new, right? Uh, so it's even hard to tell exactly what the use cases will be. So the most important things for Superfluid are actually very similar to uh, to Circle, right? It's uh, keep building for developers and enable those developers to explore those use cases, to build those applications that will onboard the users, right? Ultimately, 
pro like crypto loves protocols, but protocols don't onboard users, right? Protocols are pure, uh, you know, rules for information exchange. We need people to build applications that solve problems, right? What we do is just provide the primitives that allow those applications to create new things, right? But we still need the builders and they need to build useful things. So ultimately, providing developer tools is the single most important thing uh, that all of us can do. And onboarding developers will onboard users because if what we're doing, you know, unless we're all being uh, extremely wrong, uh, we're bringing efficiency, right? And there's no, uh, there's no way that, you know, regulatory scrutiny or, you know, the occasional implosion of uh, uh, ill-devised uh, financial scheme will stop this, right? It's still uh, useful. And that's not going to change uh, regardless of what uh, happens outside of the industry. But uh, I just want to echo again what Luca said. I do feel that we have a responsibility to make that future happen. And uh, it's one of the reasons I think a lot of people don't take crypto halfway, right? You see people fall down the rabbit hole. And the reason they fall down the rabbit hole is that they are seeing future in the making. And that is extremely exciting. Right. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, changing button colors at uh, Google. You're literally changing the way the money, ex the, the world experiences money, right? And experiences the transfer of value. So there's something about uh, crypto and Web3, which is extremely exciting for builders. And uh, building more exciting tools for those builders is extremely rewarding for us. So that's what we'll keep doing. There was a time at Google where it wasn't just about changing colors, but. <laughs> I know, I, mean, sorry for job. I know you're ex-Google. <laughs> but there was like, you know, I was only like mid-2000s, like 2005 Google. But like there was a time where like and the same things happened. Like, you know, first there were the semiconductor companies. Then there were the, you know, the Cisco's of the world. Then like eventually it reached Google. Then it became about YouTube. And it became about the apps. So I think we are, we are following the same path. And I think we're somewhere in the early part of that cycle. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, I may be older than all of you. So I have seen this movie at least once before, um, but it's exciting. It's exciting to be part of this, uh, to be building uh, at this speed, which is, which is, I enjoy tremendously. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a perfect note to end this on. I want to thank all three of you for uh, taking the time today. So look, any kill friend, really appreciate the amazing thoughtful discussion. And uh, we hope to bring you on again and have a round two of this. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining folks. All right, well, that marks the last panel and talk for the day. So before we end the summit, I wanna bring on Fran again to share some closing remarks. And uh, then we'll wish all of you happy hacking because submissions are due in two days. So uh, Fran, talk to you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kardik. So I'm just gonna very quickly share my screen. Can you see my screen? So we'll just uh, wait for you to be on the workspace so we can, there you go, perfect. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I think it's uh, it's been actually really interesting, at least for me, there were a lot of uh, things that I learned from our early guests, from uh, our later guests, the panels, everything was really interesting. Uh, just want to bring you back to Superfluid, right? So what we're doing at Superfluid is building a protocol. We're building uh, streaming money with no capital lockups and programmability on chain. Right. And as you might have uh, understood by some of the panels, some of the content, what the reason we're building this is really for builders. Right. We, we saw a technical opportunity to build a, a very interesting tool for builders to innovate the way money works. And effectively, what we saw was an opportunity to to change the way money works. Right. To change the way uh, people experience money. What happened there? I think the screen share stopped. Would you mind doing it one more time? Yeah. Sorry for that. Oh, the application, the, <laughs> the application crashed. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, so as I said, we, we saw an opportunity to change the way money works, right? And that's uh, what we were building. We wanted to change the way money works from lump sums to money streaming, right? And we can make money more, more fluid and you know, we can bring this new tool to Web3. 
And then we realized that this meant we could network cash flows, right? By simply changing the balance salt function of an ERC-20, we could enable businesses to receive and send money in real time and see this real-time balance move without any actions on their behalf, right? This was something that really opened our eyes to the opportunities that uh, bringing cash flows on chain meant, right? Because suddenly we could effectively uh, create subscriptions, salaries, all of these beautiful things that effectively created Web2, right? Web2 was created by ads, arguably, but also by SaaS, right? SaaS is the most successful monetization strategy in Web2. It's created massive companies, right? So when we understood that Superfluid could enable this in Web3, we realized that this was really an opportunity to push Web3 forward. By enabling subscriptions, by enabling cash flows to come on chain, we could effectively create more sustainable uh, Web3 economies. And this is something that we also echoed in the last panel where we talked about how yields really currently depend on speculation and the demand for speculation and leverage. But with cash flows on chain, we can change that. We can make Web3 its own economy where people are paying for services, right? Not just for leverage. And that's something we're very passionate at Superfluid about. And it's the reason we organized the summit so that we could get people who are building these tools to talk about them and their importance of them. So I just want to share with you an, ima uh, an imaginary future, which is actually not too far. So I expect we'll start seeing web-free businesses that get paid through subscriptions uh, managed by Diagonal. Those same businesses in real time will pay their salaries through CoinShift to their teams. And their teams will be invoicing them through a request network. And those, um, those people working for these companies will then reinvest their money through a Ricochet Exchange or another streaming investment platform and use part of the, that salary to maybe borrow money on Huma Finance, right? And all of this is being built. This is literally happening in our ecosystem under, uh, under our eyes right now. And I'm extremely excited to enable these kinds of use cases to happen in Web3 because these things have never happened before, right? Like forking Uniswap for the 10th time is not as exciting as building uncollateralized lending. So come and join us, come and create this vision for on-chain networked cash flows with us. Uh, we're really excited to you know, involve more people, build more of an ecosystem and increase the amount of money that we can flow through our system. And you know, our ecosystem is growing. We already have a lot of apps, but there's never enough, right? There's so many different use cases, so many different uh, verticals to explore. And we're really excited to you know, enable you to come and change the way the world experiences money with us. So for all of the developers in the room, join our Superfluid Reactor. As I said, if you're building at Hack Money, at the end of it, if you really like what you did and you think uh, that you want to turn this into a business, apply. If you get in, we will help you fundraise, we will help you launch, and we will not take anything. It's completely free, right? So this is the best, uh, the best accelerator out there because we're not going to charge you. Now, bringing us back to Superfluid, of course, it's streaming money, on-chain cash flows, but it's also building a web-free native economy with on-chain subscriptions, enabling credit, and connecting cash flows to effective, effectively make the web-free economy leapfrog traditional finance and uh, hopefully usher in uh, a new um, internet native economy that doesn't rely on the intermediaries that have, uh, you know, uh, grapple that we've grappled with so far. So that's it for me. I think uh, that is uh, an amazing wrap up of what today was all about. Thank you again for uh, being an amazing partner and uh, being the support system for a lot of the hackers that are trying to understand and basically change how money works. So uh, once again, thanks to all of the speakers. Thanks to all of you listening and, and watching this and you spent the last few hours with us uh, asking questions, sharing comments, and uh, talking about everything um, Web3 and, and money. And uh, to Mike and Fran, really appreciate having the opportunity to work with you here on this summit. Thanks, man. Thanks for having us. You got it. And that officially concludes our Superfluid Reactor Summit. So uh, thanks again to everybody who was part of it. And uh, as a quick uh, summary, if you participate in the chat, 
then you will be getting this amazing animated PO app uh, very soon. So uh, keep, a, keep an eye out on the email that you signed in with, and we'll be uh, sending this PO app to all of you shortly. And with that, I'd like to uh, wish everybody hacking this weekend uh, the best of luck with the submissions. Submissions are due in on Sunday at uh, 3 p.m. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, sign off and uh, wish all of you a great weekend. And uh, we'll see you all next week with the Hack Money finale with some of our favorite teams that will go live. So uh, thanks, everybody. And in the meantime, enjoy some lo-fi beats. Take care.